Good evening. Uh, welcome to the Calexico City Council Redevelopment Agency, Redevelopment Success Agency, Calexico Financing Authority regular meeting agenda. We're in a closed session. Uh, today is Wednesday, June 15, 2022, 5.30 p.m. I will call roll call. Mayor Javier Moreno is here. Mayor Pro Tem Camilo Garcia. Here. Council Member Raul Reina. Here. Council Member Gloria Romo. Here. Council Member Rosia Arriola Fernandez. Here. Thank you. We have a quorum. Call to order. Due to the declaration of emergency, this meeting is being held pursuant to AB 361 approved by the Governor of California on September 16, 2021. And some or all the city council members may participate in this meeting te by teleconference pursuant to Imperial County Public Health Department guidelines. City council meetings are now open for public attendance at 100% capacity of the council chambers. Public participation will continue to be available in the following ways. Members of the public are encouraged to watch the media via live stream at http community spectrum dot org live at 6.30 p.m. or via the Calexico City Hall Facebook page at www.facebook.com city of Calexico CA dot. Members of the public will be able to make public comments in the following ways. In person comments, submit public comments via email by 2 p.m. on Wednesday, June 15, 2022 to uh, clerk at ggarcia at calexico.ca dot gov or via fax to 760-768-2103. You may make public comments via Zoom from a PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or Android device. Uh, please check the link below to join the webinar. The, the telephone number to call uh, is 1-669-900-6833. Webinar ID number 852-5843-4639. And the passcode is 936337. Public comments, not to exceed three minutes. This is the time for the public to address the City Council on closed session items only. The Mayor will recognize you and when you come to the microphone, please state your name and place a residence for the record. While members of the public are encouraged to participate, it is unlawful to disturb or delay Council meetings with personal or slanderous remarks. The City Council is prohibited by law by state law from taking action or discussing items not included on the printed agenda. Please direct your questions and comments to City Council. Do we have any public comments? I have not received any, sir. No. Mr. Hort, no public comments? Thank you. Okay, adjourn to closed session. A closed session of the City Council Calexico Community Development Agency Successor Agency Calexico Financing Authority may be held in accordance with state law, which may include, but is not limited to, the following type of items. Personnel matters, labor negotiations, security matters, providing instructions to real property negotiation and conference with legal counsel regarding pending litigation. The closed session will be held in the City Hall Conference Room located at 6-story Kiever Avenue, Collective, California. Any public comment on closed session items will be taken before the closed session. Any required announcements on or discussion on closed session items or actions following the closed session will be made in the City Council Chambers at 6 Week Hebrew Avenue, Collective, California. And it is 6 uh, 5.35 for the closed session. Good evening. Welcome to the Calexico City Council, Calexico Redevelopment Successor Agency, Calexico Financing Authority regular meeting. It is 6.34 p.m. A call to order, and I'm going to take roll call. Mayor Javier Moreno is here. Mayor Pro Tem Camilo Garcia. Here. Council Member Raul Ureña. Yeah. Council Member Gloria Romo. Here. And Council Member Rosy Arrela Fernandez. Here. here. Thank you. We have a quorum. Uh, please stand for the uh, Pledge of Allegiance.
And now we have an invocation by our pastor, Frank Tasueta, from Christ Community Church. Good evening, everyone. First of all, it's an honor to be here tonight to open up tonight's session in prayer. Uh, will you join me? Father in heaven, first of all, we are so grateful, with God, that we can approach your throne of grace by way of what Christ has done for us. Thank you, Lord, for the sacrifice. And God, we would ask tonight's blessing upon uh, this meeting, Lord. We pray, God, for wisdom for those who need to make decisions. And God, for the betterment of this city, for the betterment of our lives as citizens here tonight, Lord God. We ask this in faith, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Mr. Sussman. Pastor Sussman. Please have a seat. And do we have any closed session announcements? Yes, uh, thank you, Mayor. We do have a closed session announcements related to closed session item number three in the case of Calexico Unified School District v. City of Calexico. I uh, do want to report that on May 26th of this year, the Honorable uh, Judge Brooks Anderholt uh, ruled in the favor of the City of Calexico and found that the district cannot hold the city liable for unpaid school impact fees. We'll continue to monitor the case because the decision can still be appealed by the school district, but I uh, want to put that on the, on the record. Thank you. Thank you. Now we have the approval of the agenda. Um, as a courtesy of the Marshall House Academy, I will be recognizing the Academy. I want to include that in the approval of the agenda. We have a motion to, uh, to approve the agenda. So move. So move on, Mr. Garcia. Anybody second? Second by Ms. Arela uh, Fernandez. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, motion carried. And uh, like I said, uh, first, uh, our courtesy, I am going to be recognizing uh, Mr. Lee and his family. And uh, I have an, a, a recognition. Uh, and I'm going to, I usually uh, do it myself, but I'm going to um, defer my my, uh, my duties to uh, Mrs. Romo, because I know this family is very close to you. Could you do us a favor, please? Yeah, you, please. You want me to read it? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, the Mayor's Awards of Excellence in recognition, the Master Alex Lee, Calexico Martial Arts Institute, on their 28th anniversary of the Calexico Mar Martial Arts Academy, Master Lee and his family for their traditional Kung Fu teaching where their programs help students develop and improve a mirror of critical life skills, including self-respect, focus, confidence, strength, and coordination. With a strong family focus, their unique structure also encourages families to train together, helping to strengthen the family unit. Congratulations, Mr. Lee. Muchas, muchas gracias. Es un placer para mí, siempre ha sido una, una parte de nuestra vida, hacer nuestro servicio para la comunidad. Después de tantos años, eh, hemos tenido bastantes resultados, muy buenos resultados, donde hemos podido producir uh, miembros 
efectivos de nuestra comunidad. Y todo ha sido a través de las artes marciales y, y al, al cariño y al, al apoyo de nuestras familias. A todos ustedes les doy gracias por este reconocimiento. Muchas gracias. Gracias, gracias a todos ustedes. Okay, moving on. Um, our first presentation for the night is by Jose Angel, Contract Project Manager of New River Improvement, Calexico Reach. Thank you, Mayor Moreno. Good evening, everyone. Um, good evening. Council members, uh, Councilor uh, Chief, uh, good evening, uh, members of the audience. Uh, again, my name is Jose Angel. Uh, I am the city's uh, project manager for uh, what we call the New River Improvement Project for the Calexico Reach. It's a little bit better. Uh, today, uh, my remarks are going to focus uh, exclusively for the New River in Calexico and provide you with uh, an update on where we are in, in regards to implementing the project. Uh, as most of you know, the uh, genesis of this project uh, were grassroots efforts here in Calexico. It was a community-driven uh, vision and, and, and uh, concept uh, to make, to protect public health. So that's the objective of the project. The city of Calexico became the lead for the project uh, back in 2020. Uh, it already uh, certified a mitigated uh, ne ne negative declaration for the project. And uh, since then, uh, our focus has been uh, to get the project shovel ready. So my remarks are going to focus on the progress that we made and uh, the next steps ahead. Once we get going, uh, we'll skip to the first three slides because I already covered some of the introduction. So just for the members of the audience who may not be too familiar with the project, uh, again, the purpose of the project is to divert the polluted flow from the new river that, that comes from Mexico and divert it away from the city, from downtown, uh, and uh, put it back into the river uh, at a point where it no longer poses a significant threat to the community here. Uh, the project has three main components. Uh, well, we intend to put a trash train across the New River to close to the, uh, to the uh, border, on this side of the border, uh, and then channelize the river, build a diversion structure, and put the river underground for about a mile and a half, uh, going uh, northwesterly, uh, all the way to the, where the river crosses the All American Canal. So that's, those are the two main components, the trash bin diversion structure and the bypass pipe, the underground pipe. And so that the section of the river that is being bypassed, the river channel is not dry. We are going to take treated wastewater from the city of Calexico wastewater treatment plant, which consistently meets federal standards and put it back where we start, just downstream from where we start diverting the new river flow. So what you're going to be seeing in the river channel is going to be treated clean wastewater from the city of Calexico wastewater treatment plant, which is also disinfected. So um, back in 2018, uh, the State Water Resources Control Board paid for the engineering plans and specifications uh, for the project. The plans and specifications were prepared by Michael Baker International at a point uh, and turn in back to the state when there was no project lead. So many people thought that uh, we were ready almost to start shoveling dirt and I can tell you that we were not. The uh, plans were never stamped for construction purposes or for bidding, even bidding purposes. So when the city became the project lead and secure funding for the project, uh, 
the main task was to get the pro basically the, the, the project ready for construction. And that's what, what the, myself and your staff uh, from Public Works uh, focus our efforts. Okay, so I think uh, we're back on. This is, this is the slide that illustrates the uh, project components. The idea is, again, to put a trash screen uh, about 900 feet north of the uh, border from Mexico across the New River and at that point build a diversion structure and start putting the river underground. It'll, it'll extend, for, again, is this yellow line, that's the underground pipe, and it'll start right here, and it'll go all the way to where the uh, river crosses the All-American Canal siphon. Uh, so that, again, this section that uh, no longer will carry the polluted flow from Mexico is not dry. We're gonna take treated wastewater from this location and instead of discharging it right there in front of uh, the wastewater treatment plant, we're gonna bring it back along uh, Animal Shelter Drive, although close to where uh, the trash stream and diversion structure will be. Those are the three major components of the project. There are other related uh, technical aspects of it, but those are the main components of the project. This uh, uh, overhead here illustrates where we focus and spend a year of effort these are all the permits that we need to get, uh, the major permits. There are other things that are going on, but uh, we needed uh, uh, two federal permits, uh, one administered by the state, the other one administered by the Corps, the, the, the United States uh, Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, we also needed uh, encroachment permits, uh, one from the city itself. Uh, we needed also an encroachment permit uh, from uh, USGSA, that, that is the United States General Service Administration, who manages the land, is the landowner for property near uh, the uh, Customs uh, uh, Port of Entry. And I'm pleased to report that uh, they sent us the draft permit this morning, and uh, we already provided comments back to USGSA. Uh, so we expect the permit probably within a couple of days, uh, the latest next week. Uh, so those, uh, th that was a bit, we also needed uh, a permit uh, to protect natural resources uh, from uh, the California Department of uh, Fish and Wildlife. My main point with this slide is that it illustrates all the effort that the staff has spent uh, and myself on, on uh, getting the, pro the project shovel ready. And we are shovel ready. That, that's, if you don't remember anything, we are finally shovel ready. Uh, we hire, we hire uh, Michael Baker International PAC to stamp and finalize the plans and specifications. We reach out to stakeholders so they could provide comments on the draft plans and specifications. Uh, and, uh, one, and we also hire uh, West Associate Engineers uh, pursuant to the, uh, the uh, agreement that you had entered. Uh, that they were on call basically as, as uh, consultants for the city. And in this case, they, were the, uh, the, they acted as the city engineer for the engineering department. So, so that uh, the plans could be reviewed uh, by them against uh, the uh, city ordinances and making sure uh, that they comply with building code standards. Basically, that was it. So we provided all the comments we've received and comments from the city to Michael Baker in February, early February. And uh, since then, Michael Baker was busy working and finalizing the plans and specs and addressing the comments that we provided it. To make a long story short, uh, in, uh, on April uh, of this year, April 20, 2022, Michael Baker produced revised plans and specifications for the project. Uh, I'm mentioning April 8 because it's a significant date, uh, and I'll come back to that and explain why. And uh, along with the plans and specifications, it also produced what is called uh, the engineer opinion on probable project cost. So that's the engineer's estimate on how much the project is going to cost based on uh, uh, current prices of materials, based on uh, wages, and this is a job with prevailing wages, obviously. It's not a number that gets pulled out of the blue. It's based on quantities of material needed. So, so uh, lo a, a lot of effort involved, but, but, but uh, uh, it's well worth it because it gives you a basis to evaluate bids for the project. Uh, one thing that I didn't mention, but, but it was uh, very, very important for us, so I'm gonna come back to this, the previous slide, is that uh, we had a lot of discussions with the folks from Homeland Security. Uh, as most of you know, 
uh, the area for uh, at least for the trash screen and uh, and the version structure is considered by the border patrol a very high security sensitive area and, and i want to report to you be because sometimes you deal with them they were magnificent with their support and facilitation for the project they see a lot of value in the project not necessarily from a home security but from a health perspective too because they're they're agents as you may know uh, working in and around the river, and, and at least a couple of them that I know of have, uh, have fallen head over heels into the river. So um, they understand the threat that the river quality poses to uh, th their agents too. And, and unfortunately also to the people that get in the river for X or Y reason. So they were, again, uh, very magnanimous with their support and facilitation. They also facilitated the discussions with the U.S. General Services Administration. So we have uh, what I would characterize as an excellent working relationship and they deserve mentioning uh, during the project. So I'm gonna go back to April 8 because on April 8 when we got the revised plans and specifications for the project, uh, that day uh, there was also a community meeting sponsored uh, by, by Assemblyman Garcia and uh, co-hosted by the city and Assemblyman Garcia where uh, we uh, provided an update to the community members on the status of the project. And originally, the project uh, was estimated at $28 million, and I, and I got uh, the revised engineer's opinion on probable cost after the community meeting at 10 o'clock at night. And, and, and I wish I could tell you that I slept comfortably that night. Uh, uh, the, the price on the project, uh, the revised price on the project went up uh, almost $10 million. I did expect the price to go up, but, but certainly by, not by that much. So right away, uh, myself, uh, Ms. Falomir from, from Public Works and, and, and the city engineer, we started uh, digging into uh, the revised opinion and uh, tried to understand why the cost went so much. And we engaged Michael Baker and started discussions with them as to, you know, and we did uh, uh, discover uh, things that, that were not obviously uh, consistent with the quantities of materials, et cetera, et cetera. From, there were technical aspects that, that needed to be revised on the quantities and so forth. Uh, and there were also uh, just uh, judgment things that uh, we, we needed to make a, a, as close call as possible. To make a long story short, we had at least three meetings where we just discussed the cost and some of the technical aspects. And, um, and they sent us a revised opinion again on April 28th. And that revised opinion is the opinion that on the cost that we're using for the project. Uh, and it is about $34.5 million, okay? So that opinion includes uh, a contingency factor, and it also includes what is called an escalation factor, okay? The contingency factor addresses, covers the cost for things that you don't know that, that you can find on the field. And, and the escalation factor covers potential delays in ordering the materials because materials go up in price. So we're covered. So we feel comfortable about that revised opinion. Once we arrive at that number, uh, we engage our key partners at the state level. We also engage our key partners, local key partners, the IAD uh, and Imperial County to not just informing about uh, the uh, revised opinion, but, but also uh, look for ways to make up for uh, the, additional, uh, the additional money for the project, okay? And, and uh, the message that I wanna leave you tonight with and to the members of the public is that the state did not flinch at this thing and the state told us, please continue to implement the project because we're gonna get the money. Whether it's 10 million or 15, 15 million, uh, they give us a sense of comfort that the money is going to be there for the city. So we move full speed ahead with the implementation of the project. And, and, and after we got that sense of comfort, what we did, we, we sent the invitation to bid uh, uh, for, for the project. It was published uh, last month on the 16th. And uh, since then, we've just been focusing on uh, addressing comments from potential bidders and equipment suppliers. Uh, and uh, today we have uh, had about uh, 
13 different comments from uh, uh, suppliers and, uh, and, and uh, potential bidders. There was a mandatory uh, meeting for potential bidders that we held as part of the invitation uh, to bid. It was one of the requirements. And by most standards, it was well attended. We had uh, for sure five potential bidders that were other local uh, subcontractors probably. Um, and uh, two of those uh, uh, potential bidders uh, requested that the deadline for submitting bids be extended. Uh, the main reason is that uh, the current delays with getting quotes from equipment and, and, and uh, material suppliers because of the backlog on construction that resulted from the pandemic. So it was a sensible request after uh, internal discussions and discussions at the policy level. We granted the request. We amended the bid, uh, the invitation to bid. And uh, uh, so bids are due to the city on the 28th of this month. Okay. Uh, we're, we're ready to evaluate the bids, and it's my hope that we'll get at least two bids, good bids. Uh, the, the, the evaluation is fairly straightforward. Again, it's, it's, we're just going to compare the, what, what uh, the, the bidders are bidding the cost, in other words, against the engineer's opinion and the quantities uh, thereof. So, 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 so that's wh wh where we are. Uh, at the policy level, uh, the uh, state uh, is uh, moving full speed ahead to break ground on on this summer. So that that also tells you. Uh, and uh, during the for the groundbreaking ceremony, there's two cabinet secretaries that, that would be attending, obviously. And I wanted to mention that just to give you the sense of comfort that I got that since they're bringing high, high level people out there. They're uh, committed to get the, the, the city money. Uh, at this point, it's, it's, it's not a question of whether the city is going to get the money. It, it is a question of from which pot of money the city is going to get the money uh, to the rest of the money to implement the project. I wanted to leave you with that thought that uh, uh, we have had uh, tremendous support from the state, uh, Cal EPA, namely, and uh, the Department of Water Resources. And when we needed uh, also tremendous political support from the IID and, and uh, needless to say the council and, and, uh, and also the uh, county uh, to ensure that the city has uh, the resources that it needs uh, to <coughs> implement the project. Th that is where we are. Uh, again, the main focus right now is uh, on uh, getting bids and evaluating the bids uh, at the earliest practicable time so we can come back to you uh, during a public meeting uh, for you to consider a recommendation on a contractor. Um, we'll do that in very, very short order. Uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, as far as I'm concerned, black and white. I mean, there's not too much uh, subjectivity that is going to go on evaluating the bids because we have a, a, what we believe a fairly good engineer's opinion on the probable cost to use it as a, as a barometer for, 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 for the bids. Um, I'll be happy to answer any questions. There have been a lot of other discussions on other aspects of the project. I don't, I don't want to get into the minutia uh, of the technical aspects of the project. The main thing is that the project is on track. We, we made a commitment to you that we were going to get it done, and we are going to get it done. And, and now uh, the, the, the focus has shifted uh, to the groundbreaking aspects of the project. So we're no longer, and we need this or that. Yeah. Uh, it is about implementing the project uh, for the people uh, of Calexico, and quite frankly, for the people of the region. This project is the beginning of what needs to happen with the rest of the New River on this side of the border. And we're still counting on Mexico doing its job to curve the degree of pollution of the river. Because our intent is not to send it faster and more polluted to Sealy. Our intent is to implement the project here, get the river outside where it poses a, public, uh, a threat to public health, and downstream from Calexico start treating the river also. I want to thank you for your attention, the opportunity, and uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank, thank you, Mr. Angel. Does anybody have it? Yeah, I, I do. Um, thank you, Mr. Angel. Um, I was uh, the one that requested this presentation. Why? Because uh, you mentioned a few key things that I wanted to make sure that we uh, got from you and, this, and then also the citizens. I know that you mentioned a few things. You know, this is a, a grassroots effort that uh, it came out of a grassroots effort to address that issue that we have had so, for so many years. 
And I think finally we, we're uh, looking at solutions now. Um, and also the, the shovel ready. You know, I love that phrase that is shovel ready or, or we're at that stage. Uh, but then also um, I'm looking at um, the $6 million that we need to find, right? And you did mention a few, a uh, couple of agencies, Cali PA. Um, in your conversations, who has stepped up to say, you know, we're going to give you the money or, or a timeline where we can know when will we um, have a date? Because, you know, as the state moves with their budget, f you know, I know that there is plenty of money on, on, on surplus right now. Sure. But, you know, is there a date that we should be looking at just as the date that you pointed out as being very important? To me, it's also very important also find out when we will we uh, find yeah. out. Excellent question. I was hoping one of you would uh, key it off, actually. So the answer is yes, there is a date to make that determination who's going to come up with the money. It's not a question of whether there's going to, there, there's going to be money for the project. The question is who's going to do it, right? Uh, if it's less than $10 million, it'll be one agency for okay. sure. Uh, the agencies that all the agencies have stepped to the plate, okay, DWR and the and, and Cali PA, both have stepped up, and both manage different pots of money. There's a pot of money uh, that is already appropriated; it's uh, 10 million dollars. That either if, if if the project comes in less than 10 million dollars over the 28 million dollars, in other words, if it comes in at 38 million dollars the money will be in the, in, in the agreement with the DWR sooner than later. And it will be from one pot of money. If, if it's more than $10 million, let's say it's $20 million, it will come out of the $50 million that are in the, in the uh, uh, proposed budget for the new river. Uh, the proposed budget, uh, the, the legislature has uh, an item uh, specifically uh, mentioning money for the new river and the Tijuana River, and it's $100 million split in half. So there's $50 million coming this way for other to continue to address the problems of the new river. So, so if it's more than $10 million, it will come from the budget, okay? Uh, if, if it's less than $10 million, uh, it will be administratively transferred from one account to another because the money is already there. But it wasn't designated for this project. It was designated for the new river. So uh, they would prioritize Calexico for, for taking a, a getting the money. Okay, so thank you, and uh, j just when you find out about the dating, hopefully the word of the extra money, please let us know so we can celebrate Absolutely. finally. But uh, then the other thing that I have also is that, um, so uh, on your bids, you know, you, they're due by the 28th, but you know, people are asking, you know, or, or potential bidders are asking for extra time. So. Is, is that correct or, or is there We a already mix? extended it oh, to you the 28th. Extended. So, so the already. deadline, uh, a firm deadline is the 28th? Yes, it was due on the 16th, okay. I believe, or the 15th, maybe 16 or 15th of uh, this month. Uh, it was, they were due today, actually. Okay. But we extended it by two weeks. So that's the extension of it? Correct. Okay. Yes, because, you know, what I'm, I'm afraid also is that if we keep on postponing, you know, uh, this, this deadline, you know, the cost is going to go up. No, you're right. So I want to make sure that hopefully we can set it in stone and, and just continue to, uh, with the, with the, the project uh, deadlines so we don't incur any additional cost. That's one. And another thing, um, how much is the contingency for this project? There, there, is, a 10 percent, there, there 10%? is a 10% contingency. Okay. And there is a 7.5 escalation factor. So in essence, there is a 17.5 okay. contingency uh, for, for the project. Uh, tip, this project typically are 10% contingency. So that's why we, we felt comfortable with the 10%. But there's also the 7.5% uh, for escalation. Uh, you, you're right, uh, just to give uh, the members of, of the council and, and in the audience a sense of what, what we're talking about is that the materials have gone up in price for a number of reasons, including the pandemic. Uh, the, the cost of gas, even the war in, back in Ukraine has affected the price of gas here. The big pipe, which is the 72-inch pipe for the project, is about a mile and a half of pipe. That one went up in price three times. From, from, from 2018 to today, and, and, and just that pipe is about $17 million. So, so it gives you a sense of what, what we're talking about this. If we, if, we, if we shelf the project, it's gonna be more expensive, obviously, to, to, to uh, implement the project. So no, yeah, yeah, your, your point is well taken, uh, Councilman. Uh, we are moving, uh, we, we, we granted the deadline 
because we believe it was justified, but also because we expect better quality bids. Uh, we, 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 the, 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 the potential bidders have more time to get accurate numbers, for, for get accurate quotes on materials, on equipment, so so. It was legitimate uh, in our opinion, but it would also, we, we think also it's gonna save us money based on the quality of the bids that we expect. Yeah, well, th th thank you for your work, excellent. And I'm uh, looking forward to the groundbreaking and I started moving some dirt, literally. So, but thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? No? Thank okay, you. thank you. Ms. Falomir promised to take the uh, training wheels off of my yeah. tricycle. <laughs> so once we get rolling with the right. project, so anyway. <laughs> well, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next presenter is uh, Ileana Palomir from the uh, Public Works uh, Manager Administrative on Colexico Rockwood Avenue Rollout Project. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members, those Good present evening. and um, watching. I'm here to um, uh, talk about a project that we currently have. It's our Rockwood Rollout Project Quick Built. The items that we'll be discussing is, of course, you know, what is a Quick Built a project, the project goals, the timelines, the design, um, the placemaking elements, the community engagement, and the next steps. Back in 2018, the Southern uh, California Association of Governments did a call out for projects and the city applied for what was called our Rockwood Promenade Project, which would be between 1st Street and 2nd Street. We were able to obtain the grant. SCAG is the lead agency and we are the co-applicant. The grant amount was uh, uh, 250 total uh, with uh, 225 a thousand from SCAG and then 25,000 from in-kind services from the city. The project team, of course, uh, for the city of Calexico is our interim city manager, myself, and SCAG. Also, we have present our um, former city manager who was also part of the beginning of this project. Um, for SCAG, they went through the RFP process and obtained a consultant, which is KOA and they have their subconsultants uh, here in LA, which does the community touch points and urban design. They also have Leslie Scott Consulting, which does the engagement. Um, they also have their partnership with a safe route and also LA County Bicycle Coalition. So what is a quick build? A quick build is a pilot infrastructure uh, project that provides opportunity for a city to test improvements for people walking and biking and engaging the local community, collecting and evaluating feedback and data, and expedite permanent changes. The quick build or this project should be uh, between six to 12 months. Also, the quick builds are used as short-term, low-cost, and scalable interventions that allow for modifications and feedback before a permanent project. Um, some of quick builds, if you see on the right-hand side, is from uh, Ohio Build in 2020, where you have um, traffic, uh, traffic marking pavements, uh, flexible delineators, uh, plans, <coughs> and signage. The Rock Road um, quick, quick Build Projects, Goals and Objectives, is of course, you know, to do a Rockwood Avenue provenance, again, between the first and second street, promote walking and bicycling, and also improve safety and commercial success. Um, as I mentioned, we submitted the application back in 2018. Uh, due to the t pandemic, um, there was of course a pause, but we had our first kickoff meeting uh, back in October, 2021. Since then, we have had several formation and uh, we have, since then, two um, teams have been formated, which is the technical and the community advisory committee, where we have invited, for example, city staff, as well as um, some board and commissioners from the city of Calexico, and also business uh, owners from the downtown area, as well as the council. Since, um, December 2021 through April 22, data has been collected. 
um, and also we've been, been uh, getting the existing conditions of the uh, downtown area. Back in May 14, there was our first uh, walk and audit where we got the opportunity to meet at Border Park and we walked all the way from Border Park down 2nd Street through Rockwood and then back on 1st Street all the way back to um, Border Park. And the community and those who uh, went to the audit were able to provide their feedback and what would they like to see if um, for during the quick build. Um, right now, we're in the process of the concept design, which I will show a little later, but also we are in continuing with seven community touch points. As I mentioned, we already have one and we still need uh, an additional six. And we estimate for the quick bill to be um, installed in the fall of 2022. And we expect to have that quick build in a six month period. And hopefully once we get the feedback, then they'll come before city council to see if that's something that they wanna see permanent. And if that's something that they wanna see permanent, then you know, we have concluded the project and then we will close it out, um, hopefully by, um, by 2023. This is the area of the Quickville design again, Rockwood Avenue between first and second. So it's the Garnet area uh, as you see. Here are just some examples of the placemaking elements that can be added, for example, art of the crosswalks, um, signage wrapping on poles, uh, maybe some signage on the sidewalk with, with art. Some other items is, for example, temporary uh, furniture, seating, planters, uh, traffic control, as well as uh, bus bulbs. Um, before you is just uh, an example right now of what so far we have gotten back from the feedback from our community. Um, it's hard to see, but the blue section area would be a mural. The uh, Calexico Arts Council received a, I believe it's a $25,000 grant from the Bloomberg Foundation. So they will be doing the murals. We, the city, would just need to provide um, the dimensions and through the Art Council, they'll do a request for artists and then we can go through the process. This placemaking uh, place elements, for example, on the southern portion of Rockwood, we have, for example, um, some lights that can probably, of course, we would need the authorization from the property owners connect from one side of the building to the others all the way to Second Street. And then maybe in the bottom have uh, planters, have tables where you know people can go and sit down and enjoy. And in the upper um, north of Rockwood Avenue for e events, you know, like leave it a little bit blank so there can be any type of events and they can have it on the uh, north part of Rockwood Avenue. But this is just a place making element. We're still do going through the concept and design phase. Um, as I mentioned, on May 14th, we had our first walk and bike audit. Um, participants' main uh, concern or feedback that we received uh, was the quality of the road of the project area, pedestrian safety, and emergency access. Um, they, uh, they also, participants were most in favor of including such elements as trees, planters, a great traffic control um, during the quick build demonstration. Um, here's uh, the, the community touch points. Um, again, we still are pending six. Uh, we already uh, completed one. And, and these touch points just will provide the most intimate and creative meanings of the community to engage and understand the heart of Rockwood rollout. At least three will be specifically used as art-based methods. And the goal again is, you know, to just get the feedback from the community as to what they would like to see in our downtown area. And our next steps. Our next steps is to have six additional touch points. Again, finalize the design and concept of the Rockwood project. And then hopefully by fall, we have everything in place and we can do the installation for a period of six months and depending on the feedback we received, then we would come
um, before City Council to see if they want to do it on a permanent basis, and then we can complete the project. This uh, project also has a website, so I invite everybody who is uh, the council, those present or watching, to log in and provide us your feedback because there is a survey and we want to hear from you to see what uh, additional items you would like to see in, in on Rockwood Avenue between 1st and 2nd Street. And if the council has any questions. I don't have anything. Anybody have any? You do? Go back to slide number 10, please. Here we go. You know, now we're going to try this at close. I'm sorry, my microphone is not working well. Hello? There we go. So I, I had some question, uh, some questions uh, where council could probably give direction now that we're seeing this as an entire council, I know. When it comes to this particular project, it's been myself and Mayor Pertem Garcia that have been attending these meetings. I wasn't present at the May 14th meeting. That was the day that Planned Parenthood had the rally for women's rights, and I just happened to not be able to go to that event. But one of the, la one of the things that was left pending for that meeting was a discussion on the scope of the project. So I know this is barely a, a concept and design phase, so this is why I want to bring it up now and with the entire council. That intersection on 2nd and Rockwood. There needs to be a discussion, two separate discussions, as to whether this project will close 2nd and Rockwood, and then a separate discussion about if it was gonna close 1st and Rockwood. Why? Because a, a project like this is supposed to be a, a, a sort of traffic study. And if we're only closing first, the, the middle part, not any intersections, we're not really, really gonna get any value out of the study. We're not really gonna change traffic patterns with those modifications. You know, it's kind of like an art project as opposed to a serious traffic study. So, I mean, think definitely to make this a serious traffic study that is in line, not only with what ICTC has coming down, but also in line with our own goals and the ARPA budget, which calls for the complete closure of First and Second Street. Um, we definitely, I definitely think Second and Rockwood has to be closed. That one will actually let us study behavior because that's an artery into, in, into, into Mexico. Uh, that one is a very big conflict point because people will speed through there trying to get to the border as fast as possible. And so if we want to study an actual change, we have to test an actual change, even if it feels inconvenient and that's the whole purpose of, of this grant is to test it out, especially because we know that the voted direction of the city is to eventually cr close first and second. Um, so I, 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 would, I would just leave that. And other than that, I'm very excited for this project. Oh, and on the plants, uh, especially the trees, uh, if we can make sure that they're native trees, especially those native trees that have a lot of shade, como el mesquite, uh, that, that would be nice. Thank you. So, uh, again, it is my understanding that it will be closed, right? First through second on Rockwood, right? Temporarily, uh, as this project, you know, um, it, it's implemented for, for whatever time, you know, at least six months, and then w it will be up to us. So I think it's a, a very good opportunity to gauge, you know, not, I don't want to say a traffic study, but uh, just uh, um, maybe have the community and even the, the business community too, um, and I think after we did that um, walk audit, uh, the, the individuals that came down, you know, the engineering uh, firm and other individuals that came down to uh, help us with that, you know, they left some uh, information for people to take, you know, some uh, flyers or some, uh, um, you know, uh, door hangers type of thing. Um, has there been any uh, feedback to you as to uh, if the community has provided any feedback on, on this project? Yes, um, last time I checked, there was approximately um, about five people only used the barcode. Um, but uh, again, you know, we, we invite the community, it's still, the survey is still online to give us their input. Um, but for the, the, as you mentioned, um, I, and I, I'm sorry mm -hmm. I didn't uh, mention it, but um, some t door, some, well it's like a door tag was yes. installed in the alley uh, between first and second where community members could go and pick up the tag and do the barcode and it'll take them directly to um, the survey. 
uh, because we have had low turnout on the survey, uh, we had talked about putting uh, a little message in our utility bills to direct also um, our residents that way so they can provide their feedback. Okay. So th that's what I wanted to know because, again, that the number of people that showed up that day was also very, very few uh, of us. Um, and the feedback that we could uh, provide, you know, yes, based on what we saw, based on probably that, um, what we would like to see with that area. And I think this is a, good, a, a very good opportunity to see it as a pilot program because uh, we have been talking about ways how we can revitalize our downtown. And I think this will be a perfect test to uh, explore those options. Um, again, very few times we're gonna have an opportunity to test it or to test uh, at least in a six month uh, period. And hopefully something that we can agree as a community. And I say as a community, not just uh, the individuals here present and, and everybody else out there, but also the business community. We need to hear from them, from them, make sure that they provide feedback. I know there were some concerns with, uh, you know, trucks coming and going, uh, emergency, or also um, uh, vehicles coming in and, and going out, maybe if there was a need. So all those things. But again, this is something positive. This is something that I want to make sure that the community provides feedback. You know, it's really important that this is one of the things that, you know, can change our city, can finally uh, bring something to our downtown. Um, and again, we're not, it's not coming out of our money. You know, it's a grant. So let's, let's provide feedback, uh, you know, uh, whether it's wanted to see trees, wanted to see something colorful. Uh, colorful. Uh, one of the things that I was, uh, you know, really excited about was just trying this out, see how it works, and then if we don't like it, well, we don't keep it. But if we like it, then we can continue with that, you know, um, um, plan for downtown that we have been talking about. So please provide feedback. Uh, if you can just go back, and I know that there's information on our website, but if we can put it like really front and center on our website where people can go and utility bills and everything else, definitely, definitely we need their input because we don't want to be the ones, the only ones providing that. So let's get engaged. But thank you for the presentation. I appreciate it. Lily, I, I think uh, what is really crucial here are business. You know, the businesses that are, that are there, we need, really need to have their input because it is going to affect them. And like you say, you know, the trucks going in, an emerging site that they need to bring in. So that's another thing we really need to look at before we start. But then again, it's a good project, and I really, really would like to see it going. Uh, yes, well, for the emergency and safety, um, uh, I, I've been tasked to uh, coordinate a meeting between our fire police and also Republic Services, mm -hmm. so we can get their input as to, for, especially for emergency or the pickup of trash. So we'll be having a, a meeting with them uh, in the next couple of weeks. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, j j just to clarify, so that intersection with the mural, as of right now in that project design, is to be closed or still open to car traffic? No, the mural will only be within the, um, the intersection. I spoke to our chief, uh, Chief Serrano, and he said that we could go ahead and do a mural, but inside the intersection, make sure that we still have the crosswalks so um, our residents or our, our drivers can know where to stop. Oh. So for right now, it, the mural it, the mural is just going to expand to the intersection, but it's not going to be closed. It's not okay. No, that intersection does need to be closed for to have a real traffic study, and also it's going to ruin the mural if you have tires. Just you know, come on. Como se dice? And then the second one is what's, what's the second one is uh, oh the idea about community engagement. So this is a community. I mean, we have some advocates here that have been very successful in uplifting. Uh, community surveys for the city, uh, Calexico needs change and IV equity. They should be engaged for sure. They'll get you um, very good tools and social media. But also, um, I think it's, it's very inappropriate, f uh, not, not to saying that you're, you're alone in this, but I think it would be a very, a, a better practice for this community to not go with paper or digital surveys um, and instead do oral surveys. I think people, especially the amount of hours that they work here, they definitely, if you catch them at Walmart, it's, hey, como estas? Hey, we're doing this project right here. Quiero saber, señora, que, que piensa? No, pues, se mira mal porque Lureña está loco con esa intersección. Or, como se dice, something, something of that nature. And that's more valid and, and immediate feedback than, oh, let me, let me read the question and try to get through the technical terms and stuff. It, it would be a, a good idea. Yeah. If the grant can fund that, that community engagement to, to shift it from these 
digital tools to, hey, vamos a ir a la Walmart, vamos a ir downtown, and we're going to go to the businesses one by one and, and get their opinion. Yeah, I'll get uh, the feedback that is tonight. I'll go ahead and, and discuss it with KOA. As I mentioned, we still have six more additional community outreach, and that would be something um, that we can prop, prop to do for the project. Excellent. Muchas gracias. And I also want to highlight that the, on that day, they did have the digital, the paper, and they also reached out to the community members that were walking out. So there was the, the oral oh, portion yes. of it was there. Yeah. Uh, but I actually said this is only the first out of six. And we'll make sure that we get everybody engaged on this project. And as Anitas. No, and Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, yeah, sure. Mayor Pacham Camilo can attest, Mr. Garcia, you know, they also, uh, as we were walking along, uh, we got some more comments of the downtown area that didn't involve this project, but we were there to listen to the community. La gente yeah. es bien I love it. It's good. <laughs> Okay, anybody else? No? That's Thank it. you. Thank you. Our next presenter is uh, Denise Garcia of Human Resources Department on open enrollment. Good afternoon, Mayor Moreno, Council members, and Good everybody afternoon. in attendance tonight. I was asked to bring to you tonight uh, a presentation on our open enrollment. And for those of you that don't know what an open enrollment is, it's an optional event for our employees um, and it's held annually. And the intention is to provide city employees with the opportunity to meet one-on-one -on -one with human resource representatives, health and supplemental benefit providers, um, all in one central location. Gabby, you want to move to the next slide? So as I just discussed, uh, it is a time for employees to come in to select optional and supplemental benefits. They can review their existing benefits with plan providers that are on site. It, this year, um, we were able to have one in person again this time after a hiatus of COVID for two years. Uh, and during COVID, we still had an open enrollment um, event, but it was not in person. We moved it to webinar, Zoom platform, like everything else during COVID. T telephonic appointments were available um, to employees, and the providers were contacted directly by the employees that had questions. Uh, we held, Gabby, next slide. We held the open enrollment event on May 31st, and that was the in-person event, and we held that at the library, Camarena Library, thanks to the library, uh, and Lisa um, over there for making their room available to us. June 1st was originally intended to have set alone appointments, one-on-one -on -one appointments for the employees to schedule in advance so that if they had to bring a spouse and talk in private about their own benefit options, they could do so. Um, only about five employees took advantage of that option, so uh, some of the benefit providers offered to come back the next day and be in person, and so we, we went ahead and did that. We had a total of 30 employees this year that took advantage of the in-person uh, event. Gabby, the next slide. So employees were notified several different ways. We posted flyers around the building. Um, the event had been scheduled uh, approximately two months in advance. Flyers first started going out to inform and engage the employees. Uh, citywide email was sent May 11th follow-up emails, and I, I have a tendency to be repetitive with my emails so that the employees are aware of what's going on. Uh, May 16th, May 24th, final reminders were sent again the 27th, the, the 31st, and also on June 1st again as a final reminder for that last day. Next slide, Gabby. Um, again, uh, all city employees were invited. We tried to entice the employees this year with snacks. Gabby, next slide. Uh, refreshments, healthy ones. We tried to stick with a healthy option um, so that uh, 
you know, we could promote health at a health benefit uh, open enrollment event. Next slide, Gavin. We had our providers there. Uh, one, one provider donated a raffle prize, the air fryer, which was happily accepted by the winner. Um, we allowed our providers to go ahead and they did the honors, they drew the tickets. So the employees that attended were allowed to fill out a ticket and put it in the box and our providers got to draw the names for us for the, the prizes that were provided. Next slide, Gabby, you can go through those. You can see uh, we took some pictures of the providers pulling out the, uh, <laughs> pulling out their, their winning tickets for the employees. The employees were contacted either that later that afternoon on the first uh, or the very next morning to come pick up their prizes. So we do anticipate more employees to come in. Again, we had 30 in person. We've been contacted, aside from that, directly in human resources, and some employees actually reach out directly to the providers themselves to find out about the options. All employees received contact information for every provider that was there for both days. So we do, again, expect more employees to come in. We do have a deadline uh, for all changes to be made, so all all submissions need to be made by the 27th of this month for a smooth enrollment so that all the changes can be effective for July 1st for the new plan. Any questions? Yeah, I don't have um, So I, I guess this, this might, must be a yes, but I have to ask. Were the employees provided time off from work to make sure they made an appointment and participated in this event? Definitely, okay. definitely. And we did have some come in that were off on their own time, and they came in specifically for this event on their days off. Okay. Yeah. So let, let's just make sure, and I'm, I'm glad that you did that, that, that they get offered that option, um, and that goes without saying, so they can we, look we at We actually had one department that did, they passed around a schedule. Okay. So the employees got to choose what time they wanted to come over. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank yeah. you. Thank you, thank you for your presentation that before was made. And thank you, Yoli Cordero, supporting this event. Thank you very much. Yeah, and I do have to give thanks. I couldn't have done this this year with all of the other work that we have in our office without the help of my, I, I call, I say one and a half staff because Kim is actually an yeah, IBC intern. Staff, yeah. Um, turned into a volunteer. So now she's, her internship is over and she decided to volunteer. So she made her fill out yes. the volunteer form and now she's loved it so much she's volunteering. So thank you, thank you to, to Sally and Kim both. Yeah. That was for you, Kim. Uh, oh, of course, the presentation. <laughs> thank you for helping out. <laughs> thank you, Denise, again. Yeah. Uh, our next presenter is uh, interim chief. Yeah. For police, Jesus Serrano. Good evening, everyone. Uh, everyone present and now also out there in the community. Uh, today we're going to talk about the response uh, to an active shooter event. Uh, as you all know, uh, in the recent uh, days and weeks, there's been a, a, a large number of uh, active shooter events, whether it be at school, mm -hmm. um, malls, or also on uh, public places. So. This is, a, this is an overview of uh, the presentation. You know, we're going to definitely focus on prevention and, the, and the, uh, deterrence. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about a little bit about our, our response as a uh, police department and also local law enforcement agencies. Uh, we'll talk about uh, the criminal investigation, the re reunification of the, of the students and, and victims uh, at the scene or at the hospital or at the coroner's office. So first, the active shooter definition is, uh, is any, any individual actively engaged in, in killing or attempting uh, to kill people? And is, this could be at, at any uh, populated area. So this, uh, the active shooters could be anywhere. It could be an office space, it could be at school, it could be at the mall, it could be at uh, medical facilities. Uh, so basically, anybody doing that, the active uh, killing or attempting to kill someone in a, public, uh, in a populated area, then that's kind of what we uh, identified as a uh, active shooter. So first, uh, we're definitely going to work out. Uh, we've 
since we've, we've talked about the schools, we've uh, created a partnership with uh, the Calexico Unified School District. And uh, also, we're going to reach out to the private schools and uh, also the city departments. So whenever we, we do have a, an incident or if we're in, in the process of preventing one or deterring uh, people from conducting an incident like this, we'll work together as a, as a team to uh, make sure we keep our, our kids, our family members, our, uh, our parents, uh, our relatives safe uh, in the community. Uh, also, like, like I said, law, local law enforcement partners, uh, state uh, law enforcement, and federal law enforcement. As in the area here in Calexico, uh, we have uh, local, which is the police department, uh, and also uh, San Diego State, which is also, uh, they have their own police department, but we are uh, definitely working uh, together as a, as a team to prevent or deter any uh, active shooter at, at the San Diego State. Also for the state, uh, we have CHP, and we have... Uh, uh, other state agencies like ABC uh, and also uh, uh, other law, like for example, uh, the Bureau of uh, Narcotic Enforcement, that's going to be uh, also a state law enforcement agency. And in federal, we have uh, Border Patrol and also CBP and uh, all the other ATF, uh, um, FBI, and uh, DEA here. So when this incident occurs, everybody's going to show up and we definitely need to be coordinated enough to be able to, to solve or mitigate the, the threat at that time. So first, um, here it is in, uh, in Calexico, we have uh, eight elementary schools, two junior highs and one high school with two campuses. Those, that's going to be our major focus since that, that is the, the largest group of people that, that are, are gather on a daily basis uh, for eight, about eight hours a day, every day. And we're working together with, uh, with their safety team to be able to mitigate any uh, situations that they have, whether it be a natural disaster, uh, active shooter, bomb threat, fire, or any uh, emergency incident. And then we have private schools also that we're working together to uh, make sure that, that, that they are safe also since they are in our jurisdiction. Uh, the Calexico Mission School, Our Lady of Guadalupe Elementary School, Vincent Memorial High School, and then in Imperial County, uh, community school, and then any other private or public schools uh, like daycares and uh, all the other public uh, entities that uh, teach. So prevention. So as we work together with, uh, with the, the, high, the high school and the school district, our goal is to, to prevent uh, any active shooter. Our, our focus is uh, on prevention because once it, it happens, it's definitely too late. Uh, so we're gonna eventually we're gonna get their uh, their safety plans, which we are reviewing right now, to make sure that we understand what their safety plan is in the case of an event, and also uh, we're gonna f figure out if there's any room for improvement, and then we're gonna create a, a training program for us, for our local partners, law enforcement partners, and also for the school, and we're trying to get that done before um, the beginning of the, of the school year. Um, and then uh, public education, since you know everybody has has a role to play. So basically, uh, the Department of Homeland Security has developed a a, a program, a see something, say something um, campaign. So if you see that there is a potential of, a, of an active shooter or, or a threat to any of the schools or public areas, we want you to call. We want you to make sure you make that phone call and let us figure out if it is an actual threat or is not. And if it's not. No, no, no harm, no foul. But if it is, we definitely want, want to be able to prevent it. Um, our goal for, for the department is to train our staff for response time. I know that all of you guys have heard uh, about the, the shooting in the school in Texas, that law enforcement waited a little too long to uh, penetrate and, and infiltrate into that room. We're definitely going to have uh, our officers train in, so there won't be that delay or, or that hesitation for us to go inside the rooms. But you got to take, take into consideration, you know, active shooter, someone's actually shooting the gun, killing people, and we have to have the officers go in there alone most of the time to, in, in, in order for them to mitigate that threat. And in enforcement, um, we're definitely going to work with schools that if there is a potential threat, 
that we are going to charge it criminally if, if there's a, a enough basis for a criminal complaint. But then we're working closely with the school district and all the school uh, s systems to make sure that they, they are prosecuting or uh, having discipline uh, administratively in, in the schools. And then we move into deterrence. So most, most schools or more public places, you know, are soft targets per se. There's no, usually no armed personnel there. There's no metal detectors. There's no uh, police officers standing there or armed security guard in order for, for them to, uh, to be able to mitigate that. However, you know, in the school sites, we're definitely pushing for make sure that all the gates are locked. As soon as the, the students go inside, only one, one way in, one way out, that the, the, that the security guards or the proctors challenge everyone that comes on the, uh, on, the, on, on the campus, determine what is their business on the campus, and then be able to notify the school administrators. And then finally, uh, definitely harden the, the school sites. Uh, make sure that all the gates are locked, make sure they're, they're secure. We're talking about uh, with the school district, see if they're open to put uh, metal detectors or conduct r random uh, searches of, of uh, the backpacks of, of the students, which is all up to the school to decide whether they do it or not. And then continuing on deterrence, you know, remember that, that I said that we we're gonna definitely focus on deterrence because we don't want this to happen. Uh, early warning systems, you know, uh, the security of the proctors um, at, the, at, at the entrances, and we're working with the schools to make sure that they have the ability to, and, and the authority to s set up a lockdown or commence a lockdown at the time that they see a, a potential threat. And also uh, to teach the, the faculty, you know, the procedures for a proper lockdown and when to, when to open the, the doors, uh, when to fight if needed, or when to run, if uh, that's the, the best way to deal with it. Um, and then at the end, you know, we're, gonna, we're definitely going to fully investigate all, uh, all tips or all reports of, of crime. In the two weeks ago, we had, uh, we had several reports in one day of uh, potential active shooters or people with guns. And we definitely investigated each and every individual one. And uh, none of them were rose to the level of criminal prosecution, but definitely the schools uh, took uh, administrative action. And then um, we're talking about with the schools also about having an armed security guards or armed personnel on, on the schools and definitely starting a uh, school resource pro officer program at the schools. Then our, our response. As a, as a department, it's gonna it's gonna be as quickly as we can immediately, and it's gonna be a single officer response. We're not gonna sit there and wait until additional officers get there to uh, to be able to to mitigate the, the problem. So uh, on any given day, uh, our officers are working patrol. We have uh, approximately two officers and a supervisor at all times, and they will be the first ones on scene and then additional resources will be coming in. It's gonna take them some time, but our officers have the, have the equipment or have been trained to make sure that they, it, they deal with the problem at the time. So, but remember, these officers are responding to a school where there's gonna, they're gonna see people hurt, especially kids, and maybe even dead, and they're gonna have to step over them and continue looking for that threat. Because every second that they, they uh, that they hesitate, it could be someone, someone's lives. Uh, it, it, besides the, the training that we have, we're gonna have our supervisors conduct tabletop exercises with, with the school administrators and eventually go into full function exercise with our, our local partners and the schools to be able to, to test our plans that we have and test our training to see if there's any uh, improvements that need to be done or, or made. And then, um, then definitely the medical response. You know, working with uh, Calexico Fire, uh, our ambulance service, uh, the county ambulance service, AMR, and then eventually our helicopter ambulances too, because depending on the injuries, we're gonna have to
triage the, the patients and be able to send them off to wherever they need, to, they need to go. And then mitigate the mutual response. When these incidents occur, there's, everybody's coming down to help. CHP, sheriffs, El Centro, all our uh, officers from a task force, Border Patrol, and we, we definitely got to mitigate that, that response and be able to train with them to make sure that they s report to, uh, to the command post and then get assignments from there. And then eventually there's going to be a criminal investigation. Uh, we, as the Calexico Police Department, are charged with the, the criminal investigation or the investigation of the incident. Um, so then we also have to develop uh, the plans and coordinate with uh, criminal investigations of other law enforcement agencies. When an incident of this scale happens, as a department, we're gonna request uh, additional resources or help because it's gonna be so great and there's gonna be so many witnesses with so much uh, evidence to collect that our resources are gonna be tasked uh, immediately at, at the time of the, of the incident. <coughs> So that's why we're going to be able to reach out with local law enforcement, create a, a mutual aid plans, uh, both with state and federal uh, agencies, and then with uh, any other jurisdiction, jurisdictional law enforcement that, that's in the area at the time. And then reunification, um, we definitely have to, to, to work with reunification. There's going to be witnesses that need to be interviewed, so they're not going to be able to release to, to their parents. I mean, and this could, if it happens in elementary school, we definitely have to be able to work with the schools to have a, a location where we could place all these kids uh, and provide the necessities that they need at the time, whether it be counseling services, whether it be uh, medical services, whether it be food, water, restroom breaks, and stuff like that, while we get through the interview process of it, see if they did or hear it, or are they a, a potential witness. Um, and then you got to be able to reunify back those kids, back to those, to those parents. In addition to that, um, the medical response, transporting all the, all the patients to our local hospitals, there has to be a reunification plan for that, and we're definitely working with the schools to be able to provide that, that training, that information to the, to the school staff and also for the parents of those kids. And then eventually we're going to have a... a a mental, uh, a mental wellness check on all our officers and all the parties involved. So we're going to have to get our paracount mental health involved in order, in order for them to provide counseling service if, if needed. And that's kind of what our plan is. So it's not complete. I mean, there is a, a lot of room for, for improvement and, and testing our plan. Uh, but we're working together with all our local agencies and, and schools to be able to get, provide the safest uh, environment for our schools and our students in Calexico. I have Thank a question. You. Okay, this, this is a lot of information, okay? I'm going to start off with uh, years back, uh, we had the probation department that would also, and the police department that would have staff on site what happened with that? The, the funding went, or, or how can we how can we get back to that? And also, when you're talking about mental wellness, you know, you need to reach out to public health, uh, our health department, because uh, they need to have nurses or someone on site if that is needed. I, I think this is a lot of information, and and uh, you know, we, we do need a lot of work to be done because we do need to help our, our high school kids. But again, you know, what is our school district doing? Or so the school our, board? Uh, our school district is working with us together as, as a, a collaborative group in order for us to mitigate all these issues. They've, so far they've provided all, our, all their safety plans for each school and we're gonna review all of their safety plans. We're gonna uh, recommend any changes that need to be uh, made. Through those plans, we're going to create a training program that we're going to train the, the teachers and the staff uh, at each school or about their plans. Each plan is different because each school is different depending on the age of the students, depending on the layout of the student uh, of the of school, school school area and the uh, neighborhood around it. You know, like Main School is a lot different than Jefferson School. 
because you have 98 and then you have all the all the residential in, in the front and on the sides so there's there's a there's a lot of intricacies in each plan and then the, right now we we're part of their safety committee to be able to, to work together as a, as a as a group to solve those those problems or create a new new plans if needed Anyone else? Yeah. Um, so when, when was the last time or the most recent time that you met with the CUSD and all the schools um, to go over this? You know, you said there's a safety committee. I mean, has that been recently or how, do, how often does that happen? So uh, two weeks ago, we've, uh, we, we stood in and we went to their safety committee, the school district safety committee. Uh, two weeks before that, we uh, met with uh, Alejandro Limon, who is the safety person for the school district, and that's when she provided all, of, all, the, all the safety plans to us. During the time where we had all these potential threats or kids with guns, we've been in constant communication and also providing uh, press releases for the community saying that we are working together and providing a, a safe environment for the, for the kids. And, and we haven't talked this week, but we're definitely going to have a meeting next week and or the following week to make sure that our, our plans are still in the same uh, same track. Thank you. Uh, I like the, the productivity and that also maybe, uh, and this is a different conversation, but um, hopefully uh, I know we're going to have uh, talks about our budget uh, and I would like to see some SRO conversations there uh, because that's another way that we can uh, also uh, help with any potential um, not potential, but uh, issues, or at least to have a presence as, as it used to be in the past. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, that's a different conversation. But thank you. Very, very comprehensive uh, presentation. You're welcome. Ms. Roma. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chief Serrano. I request this presentation because the parent asked me, uh, the parent question is, are we ready for any school contingency? Yes or no? So the question is, are we ready for a sh uh, active shooter incident in the school? Our officers have the training, they have the equipment, they have the response and, and the ability to do the job. However, based on the traumatic event, when, if this incident does occur, mm -hmm. no agency or no uh, law enforcement agency has enough officers or enough uh, personnel to make it 100% safe. That's why we need to focus on the prevention and the deterrence. And working together with schools, mental health, and with the community, we're, we're going to try to do everything in our power that, so we don't have to respond. So we don't have to have a active shooter incident here in, 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 in Calexico. Because once it goes, there's going to be people that are going to die. And there's going to be people that are going to be hurt. So our response, however fast it is, there's still going to be people hurt. And one person that gets hurt is one too many. But we definitely want to focus on the deterrence. And we definitely want to focus on the prevention. In my opinion, we need more um, agreements and programs with the Calexico Unified School District and private schools too. Yes, I, I definitely agree. And we need to train together and doing these tabletop exercises and doing full functional exercises that will give us the, the capabilities and then find the deficiencies in our plans and be able to fix those, those deficiencies and not try to mitigate those deficiencies when it's actually happening. Perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Yoli, you want to say something? Good afternoon. My name is Yolanda Cordero. I'm a resident of Calexico. Do I need to give my address? Uh, <coughs> this is the first time I've been here in yeah, years. For our record. May I just move yeah. just work? Is this for a public comment section or that your presentation is? I mean, your, your comment right now is a public? I comment on what the chiefs just said. Real quick. Okay. Just uh, okay. sorry. Um, what I was gonna two things I just said real quick is one that I, I, I would like to and maybe you guys are doing this suggest that the
the city council needs to get together with the, with the school district, with the board, get together and have a meeting so that you guys come together in agreement because that means that the district and the city council or the members of the district and the city council are together in force so that the schools know we need to get this thing done before something happens, even though we're a small town, but it can happen anywhere. That's the first thing. The second thing is how important it is. This is the first time I went to a, uh, 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 a forum for district attorney. I had never gone to them, but I went to it this year, and I found out that we have only 13 prosecutors in Imperial County. We should have 20. They're overloaded, over, understaffed. So first, misdemeanors, when someone does something wrong, and I don't know the proper language, they do not get prosecuted. They have to let them go because there's not enough people to prosecute, okay? So all I'm saying is that we as a community from Calexico, we need to make sure go out and vote in November for the right proper district attorney to get the job and then the county uh, CEO to make sure get us find the money to get and uh, supervisors because this is wrong that we're understaffed and this is going on. Goodbye. Thank you you. Gotta stay, in, stay with the, the topic. <laughs> okay. I made an exception, but please. I appreciate that. <laughs> That's yeah. fine, really. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for the smile. Uh, our ne next uh, uh, topic is I'm going to give an update on the Farm Workers Center. Center. I know Senator uh, um, Fernandez requested that through uh, last time. Uh, I believe you asked uh, Mr. Pavila, but I think Pavila, you're a little bit limited on uh, on, on that. But the only the only update we can we can give is that we're still, I mean, Catholic Charity is still interested in in, in in helping us out with that program. However, the uh, GAF fund, who's the company that contracted, are still in the engineering process and securing some funds, and we have not received any in in, in terms of conditional use permit with the planning or anything like that. If I'm concerned, right? That's true, yeah. We've had the conversations and the meetings with GAFCON. Uh, as to date right now, we, we have nothing planned for the, the immediate time, and uh, we're still working on the, the organization right. of the plan, yes. Right. And then uh, we do have to make, I believe, a physical uh, evaluation of the premises, which is also pretty clean, which now they moved across the street. So that's going to happen in the future, go in there and find out what's, you know. And yeah, for sure. We, we need to do an audit on the building itself. Right. We've got to make sure that the contract was uh, completed and uh, applied. So, yeah, we're working on that one as well. Okay. All right. That's my update. The next items are the announcements. These proceedings may be viewed in the City of Calexico website at www.calexicoca.gov. The Friday following the City Council meeting, Committee Office Hours Mayor Moreno will be held by appointment. Please contact the city clerk's office at 760-768-2102 to schedule an appointment. And I do uh, do uh, have vis visitations, uh, appointments that I do take care of during the week. Uh, since the last time we met, we had a, you know, three or four people that showed up with some concerns in Calexico. Uh, and those been addressed in, to the proper chain of command, which is the, our city manager. Now, our next uh, item is public comments and public appearances not to exceed three minutes. This is the time for the public to address the city council on a, any item not appearing on the agenda that is within the subject matter jurisdiction of the city council. However, if the item you wish to comment on is on the consent agenda, please comment now. The mayor will recognize you. When we come to the microphone, please say your name and address. And uh, for the record, while members of the public are encouraged to participate, it is unlawful to disturb or delay the city council meetings with personal slander and remarks. The city council is prohibited by state law from taking uh, action or discussing items not included on the printed agenda. If the item you wish to comment on is in the public portion of the agenda, we will take your comments when we get to the item on the agenda. Please direct your com uh, questions and comments to the city council. Now, I do have plenty of public comments. Uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to, uh, because it's getting to 8 o'clock and I want to be here like midnight by last time, I am going to keep uh, courtesy for everybody. I'm going to keep time, three minutes, you get three minutes. Now, I'm going to make an exception because we have some new members here in the public, probably the first time they come here. Uh, they kind of convoluted everything in one, instead of keep, skipping back and forth to each item, I want to allow this, to, uh, this lady and this gentleman to come up here and then speak 
three minutes on each item, just straight through through all the <coughs> items, and then go to the next one. That's where we're going to take care of that item. And then obviously we have one item, number 18 from Ms. Alvarado. We'll get to, to that when the time comes for the item. And then we have 11 public comments individually on different, different items. Not specific, just in general. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here we go. And Mayor, real quick, just to make an, uh, a quick note on housekeeping. The stand over there with the mic, it was working before, uh, right before the meeting. We opened it up, we tried it. We should be good on that one or this one either. Thank you, excellent point. Working. Yes, so you do have, on this side of the room, you can use that mic, and on that side of the room, you can use that mic. Okay, first one's up is uh, Johanna Espinosa. And you have five items. Buenas tardes. Um, I'm going to comment on a few articles like you mentioned. I want to start with the most recent one, uh, number seven. So I just want to suggest um, that we make counseling services prior to the incidents like a big focus in prevention. Um, there is evidence that shows that you know school shooters are undergoing um, disorders or just like abuse and trauma. Um, prior to the incident, so that should be like a big focus for that. Um, I personally work at an alternative education um, school in El Centro, and the kids find ways to sneak things in, like not as big as um, weapons yet, but you know, like their vape pens, um, nail clippers, things like that. So I'm all for um, the high security, you know, metal detectors, um, maybe like emptying the backpacks, things like that, but there is also a lot of evidence that proves that that's a, what they call um, a scooter prison pipeline. Mm. And it does cause a lot of trauma and, and anxiousness um, to the students. So it does interfere with their like, academic success and just their well-being overall. So I think that's something that should be kept in mind um, through the development of this, because I know the chief did mention um, it's still under development. So I take that as like, you know, we can comment on it and we can suggest things. So that's just part of that. And now I'm going to move on to item number five. So that was a Rockwood rollout. Um, just one thing, um, we're all for cooperating. And um, as CNC, you know, like um, volunteering to do some of the murals or artwork that's going to be done. Obviously, just like, you know, if part of the grant could be used for materials and things like that. But, you know, the work first, labor can volunteer for that. Um, that's a yes. And moving on to, can I comment on like the ones that haven't been presented on? You have four and you have five, now you are up to uh, okay. eight or seven. Okay, so I'm, I'm done? Yeah, All right. Keep going. thank you. If you want to do, oh, do the other ones, it's Right, right, just oh, okay, keep going. All right, um, item number eight. So that was for the Farm Worker Service Center. Just want to suggest that cooling centers um, are a big part of that and that there could be a push for it, you know, like it's an emergency, we're hitting really high temperatures. Um, I'm not sure exactly how the center looks, I'm working on it right now, but if there's going to be one location, cooling centers can be in multiple locations, it can also be mobile, um, but we can meet um, to give our feedback on that. But just to comment on that, um, also for 17. So um, on the agenda, it says that it's the ARPA funding that's going to be distributed both for the school board and the pool um, services. So outside of that, if we can also um, think about distributing to, again, cooling centers, and then also the art projects, um, the beautification projects for the electrical boxes, um, just to keep that in mind. And I did forget to add a small part to um, item number seven. Also, to keep in mind to incorporate educational component, components um, for prevention within the schools. Um, like it was mentioned before, you know, to have a close contact with the school board as well and offer training. Um, I just recently received some training from ICOE and it was very hands on. It was basically like taking groups to different rooms and just um, brainstorming how to form barricades and how to hide if there was a case of an active shooter. And it was really in detail, so if we could maybe, you know, cooperate also with ICOE to receive that training, 
Um, it's from the safety department. His name is Alvaro. Oh my God. Um, but I can give information also through email later on. But that's all. Thank, Thank you. you. You did good. Thank you. He's my love, too. Opportunity Investment Plan letter of support. 
Um, if you guys read it, there's like talks about like Cal Poly being invested into the community. Those I mean, just also then it's like I look forward to that as well. But why? How can we don't want to be abused and like have our resources being mined and just getting the point one percent of the <laughs> the funds that they're getting? Because it's a really huge industry that's coming in, and the more we ask, I think the more it's gonna be better for us. And I don't think there's wrong. I don't think there's nothing wrong asking for more. So if I suggest that we approve this letter, we we stand by our guts to like be asking for a lot. Uh, I think that's pretty much it. Oh, number fourteen, um, <coughs> approval or uh, of a resolution to continue fully or partial uh, virtual public public meetings. I think we need that Zoom always acceptable for everyone. But oh, if we're gonna have the Zoom, we have to have the the. the the equipment proper or like the knowledge of training to have these zooms work because sometimes I know a lot of people have troubles with the zoom um, and it's old tech that we have around here like Raul's mm -hmm. mic Raul's mic or something but um, if we're going to keep doing zoom I think we should invest a little bit more into our zoom tech so yeah that's pretty much it thank you thank you our next speaker is Mr. Ben Moore members of the city council. Good evening. Okay. Thank you. Ben Horton, P.O. Box 2136, Calexico. First off, I want to give a comment about safety. A couple of weeks ago, I was in the theater and the lobby was flooding with water. I thought I'll call the police department. They'll know who's direct to come there to get it taken care of. It took a customer to turn off the water because when I called back to the police department, they said that the person has already been dispatched. He has to go pick up his truck. Mm -hmm. Last week, I did a follow-up follow -up, and asked the manager, did the city ever arrive? No, they didn't. That's a point for you to take a point of notes, okay? The next thing, I want to give uh, some good points to Rosie. She met with myself and my broker and because of the discussion with her, we're doing a project downtown Calexico to revitalize a building. Thank you, Rosie. We already got the uh, electrical plans put together, sent it to the uh, building department. We're going to revitalize a building downtown as an example. We're working on that. And that's something that we're going to be moving forward on. Another thing is Caltrans. I'm giving all these reports. I got three minutes, so I'm going to work at that. Caltrans came here and said that it was uh, economic restitution for those who had, that's wrong. That's wrong. The only uh, restitution they give is on the property. Economically, they do not do that. I found that out this week. No, last week. I'm giving some point. Right now, they're working on the bond to get a new contractor. I take issue with the fact that businesses shouldn't be compensated for the time factor, for the time factor. It was a normal deal, okay, it works. But this is not a normal deal on Highway 98. <clears throat> and I think all of you understand that part. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we at uh, the Crossroad uh, Shopping Center has already filed a formal complaint with Caltrans in reference to that. So we're moving forward on that part. One of the other things that, because I'm involved with downtown, I have a little bit of concern about the bed. Apparently, there's, uh, from what we had and what we have now, there's some discrepancies. 30 seconds, Mr. Report. Okay, I'll make it real quick. Starting tomorrow, I'm going to be asking for public records to look into it, and I'll hope to be able to give a report here at the City Council. Thank you. And thank you, Rosie. Thanks, Mr. Horton. Mr. Horton, if, if you could say for the city council comments, I do have something to say about that Caltrans situation. Uh, I beg your pardon? Uh, if you could say for the city council comments, I will be touching on a little bit about that Caltrans update, which is, just so everybody knows, absolutely true that they will not be giving any economic uh, reparations. Okay. 
okay, to well, those businesses. I know we can't discuss it, but yet we're taking appropriate action on our I'll, part. I, I, I'm going to talk about it in city council comments. Just make sure you stay. I'll stay around. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Thank you. Our, our next person is uh, Guadalupe Salcedo. Yes, sir. Whatever. Buenas tardes a todos. Buenas tardes. Okay, mi nombre es Guadalupe Salcedo, vivo en el, vivo en el 2100 de la Pierna Court, Calexico, ahí tiene su casa. Eh, yo estoy aquí porque eh, hace muchos años entré al programa de adopción de áreas verdes. Y el área verde que yo opté, pues está enfrente, por la zapata, enfrente de mi casa, que es el 2100 Pierna. Eh, pues hace ya muchos años que, que adopté esa área eh, pues uh, yo eh, tengo mi trabajo de donde mantengo mi familia y pues uh, quise hacer algo por Caléxico yo cada mañana estoy ahí a las 7 de la mañana prácticamente todos los días eh, regando este, limpiando, cortando palmas y y pues juntando la basura, cada martes que pasa la basura por ahí, pues yo lleno botes de, de lo que sea el, el retention base. Y pues uh, estamos trabajando por años muy duro. Ahorita ya tengo un amigo vecino que se llama Héctor, que está aquí también con nosotros. Él y yo pues tenemos uh, meses trabajando, trabajando muy duro con esto. Pero este ha sido un trabajo, un trabajo de muchos días, es un trabajo diario, un trabajo pues queriendo poner un granito de arena por la ciudad de Caléxico y pues como yo creo que hay muchas personas aquí en la ciudad que quisieran hacerlo yo solamente estoy mirando aquí en, el, um, en la hoja donde están las propiedades que dan en adopción pues aquí hay 26 propiedades quiere decir que hay 26 personas interesadas en apoyar a la ciudad de Caléxico aparte muchas más que en otras áreas lo pueden apoyar bueno, este, um, prácticamente no sé si se pudiera levantar la pantalla. Si lo pudieran levantar, se lo voy a agradecer. La pantalla. ¿Para arriba? Eh, pues, ¿Sí? Para hacer este, este trabajo realmente, pues, eh, no, no, pues no me pagan, lo hago por de corazón, por Caléxico, queriendo regresar algo a la ciudad de Caléxico. Y creo que muchas personas que vivimos aquí este, estaríamos dispuestos a ayudar y trabajar conjuntamente con ustedes. Yo pues leo el eslogan de la ciudad cada vez que vengo a pagar el agua y, y, y está hermoso, no sé quién lo escribió, pero está hermoso. Pero la realidad es que no es la realidad de lo que está pasando aquí en Caléxico. Dice juntos, yo por años he estado trabajando, y, y inclusive eh, hace dos años que estuve en el hospital, desde el hospital les estaba hablando por teléfono que me ayudaran, que me ayudaran. Sí, señor, le quedan 30 segundos. Bueno, pues, este, pues es un tema muy largo. Y Lo muchas digo cosas, por, por, uh, ama, muchas cosas ama, por decir, por... pero la verdad es que yo no... Ustedes no estamos juntos, ustedes y yo. Y con mucha gente de Caléxico pienso que lo mismo. Eh, yo estoy solo, yo estoy abandonado, nadie me ayuda de la ciudad. He ido 20, 25 veces a tocar puertas a la ciudad pidiendo ayuda y no me ayudan. Me dejan prácticamente solo. Inclusive algunas veces yo tengo que poner de mi dinero cuando se revienta un tubo. Yo tengo que regar con manguera, tengo que regar manualmente. Es un trabajo muy duro. Yo tengo 64 años luego con mucho gusto. Pero no tengo este, prácticamente eh, ayuda de la ciudad. Y realmente yo ya no confío en las personas que están en este departamento porque he ido 20, 25 veces. Les he hablado dos, tres veces por semana y no hay respuesta. Señor Salcedo, le voy a interrumpir, por favor, por favor, hagas, le voy a, no se vayan, le voy a hacer una cita que hable conmigo la semana que viene y me voy a encargar de ese problemita. ¿Está bien? Yo, yo personalmente, el alcalde se va a encargar con usted. Yo le agradezco que tome esta atención, este, eh, yo, yo voy a estar fuera como por tres semanas. Cuando regrese, haga, sí, nos cambiamos de teléfono y hablamos, ¿ok? Bueno, le agradezco mucho y, y, y la verdad, pues, nunca me he quejado de nada en la vida, tengo 64 años. Sí, Siempre gracias. Siempre me gusta para adelante, pero quisiera... Pues hacer un grupo, no sé, de algo que hay sí. que hacer por Calexico. Sí, lo, lo platicamos, señor. Gracias. Bueno, muchas gracias. gracias. Muy amable. Buenas noches. Buenas noches. Gracias, señor Salcedo. Our next speaker is Héctor Ochoa. 
Señor Salcedo, ¿puede poner una cita con la señora Liliana que está aquí, que es la jefa de, de Obras Públicas, por favor? Para este asunto quisiera, señor Favila, si me lo permite, que tomara ahorita en este momento en cuenta lo del señor Salcedo. Yo le aprecio enormemente lo que usted está haciendo. Señora, si pudiera usted atender al señor, por favor. Yo le agradezco mucho, con todo respeto, yo prefiero atender así Sí, la va a atender con el mayor, pero ella es la que se encarga de lo que usted ahorita en este momento está, está pasando. Ya sé que no tiene confianza, pero deme esa pequeña confiancita y hable con ella, yo sé lo que le digo. Bueno, voy a, voy a hacerlo. Se lo voy a pedir. Y luego lo va a atender. Sinceramente, eh, yo a la señora Lili le he dado 25 oportunidades, 30 oportunidades. No me siento Lili, por con favor. nada de confianza de hacerlo. Y tampoco quiero que lo haga ahorita porque viene la junta. Sí, señor, señor, señor Salcedo. Eh, entiendo. Ok, por favor, respeto a las personas okay. que queremos hablar también. Ahí. Okay. Eh. Thank you. La secretaria se va a encargar de mi tarjeta. Lo agenda, por favor. Gracias. Ok, good afternoon. Disculpe, señor. Uh, my name is Hector Ochoa. Yes. I'm his partner. Okay. I'm going to do the English version. Sure. Okay. Uh, I'm a resident of Calexico on Vienna Street, uh, 2112. Uh, both myself and uh, Mr. Lucas Acero have been neighbors for over 22 years on Vienna at the Victoria Villa subdivision. Mr. Sacedo has uh, adopted the retention basin by our uh, residents on Vienna and uh, Zapata Street. Uh, he has been working on the basin for some time now, several years, by cleaning up weeds and brush and overgrown vegetation, watering. Uh, he does this on his own, uh, I'm sorry, in his own time, uh, almost daily, uh, in the early morning hours before leaving to his place of work, Andreas Furniture. Uh, at times, Mr. Salcedo also works on the weekends on this basin. Uh, I joined Mr. Salcedo in his efforts once I retired from my ID as superintendent. Uh, we're trying to maintain a cleaner neighborhood for ourselves, our families, and for our fellow uh, Calexico neighbors. The retention basin is a very vast area uh, with enormous amounts of upkeep. Needless to say, it keeps us both very busy. Uh, recently, we planted a large amount of palm trees uh, at our own expense. Uh, to further en enhance the area. We come to you with a few requests uh, for said retention basin. Number one, repair the broken sprinklers on the basin so that the, most of the, uh, most or all of the trees can be uh, watered with ease. Uh, currently we're using the basin, uh, we're watering the basin manually with a water hose. Um, we would like to have the sprinkler timer to be turned on uh, to assure the proper watering method. Number two, finish cleaning the basin properly. Recently, a crew came out to uh, trim the trees and perform some cleanup, but the job was not completed properly. It was only half of it was done. Uh, and number three, we would like to request that work be scheduled for maintenance uh, to be done on an ongoing basis in order to keep the basin in proper working order. Uh, and just to make it short here, uh, thank you for giving us uh, the opportunity to speak and express our concerns. Uh, we greatly appreciate the City Council's much needed assistance to uh, in, type in trying to keep our neighborhoods clean. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Roy Dorantes, you're next. Yeah, here you go. Thank you. Okay, starting now. All right. Uh, hello, Council, Mayor, Hi. Council Members. Uh, I'm here to invite you to be part partners with me on a great project that we are working on. We're producing a film project on domestic violence. Um, Council Member Gloria Romo has been working with us and she has opened a lot of doors for us and, and I really wanna thank her for that. Mm -hmm. we, we are here, some of us are here and we represent over 150 people on both sides of the border that have been working on a 
this project for about, you know, about two years practically. We represent here Homeville, Imperial, Raleigh, El Centro, and I personally claim Calexico because I kind of grew up in this area. Uh, our, our movie raises a lot of red flags for people to see about domestic violence. Um, we're going to give 100% of the ticket sales to charity. We're going to give 50% of that to the Soroptimus Club of El Centro that has a, uh, a, uh, a domestic violence component. And we would like to give the other 50% to the city of Calexico to some of the projects that they have here with the seniors or with women. We're asking the city to be partners with us so that we can present the film in October here at the Rodney Auditorium for the people of Imperial Valley. Uh, we, we have an advisory committee, which is made up of uh, media people, is made up of local leaders, and we would be proud and we very honored to have also your support. So with that, I still have two, one minute, but I'm gonna give that up for other people to speak. Thank you very much. I look forward to partnering with the city of Calexico. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you, Mr. Rante. The next person is, well, I'm struggling with the pronunciation. Lives at 5, 940, El Centro, though. Is anybody from El Centro here? You are? I, I'm, I'm so sorry. How do you pronounce your name for the record? No, I'm Scoville. Okay, it's just Scoville. Thank you. Speaker is Barry Reels. Reels, I'm sorry. Uh, it happens all the time. So <laughs> okay. Quite used to it. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Hi. Yes. Okay, members of the council, mayor, uh, uh, everybody here in attendance. I'm, I'm an actor in this uh, this film, Me on a Mas, that uh, with Roy Durantes, and uh, what I would like to mention too is that this this is a cross-border project that has brought together um, actors and aspiring filmmakers, producers, makeup artists, etc. On, on both sides of the border. I see that um, Imperial County or whatever, the International Gateway, City of Calexico, okay, and um, that kind of puts this area in kind of a unique position with, you know, Mexicali just across the uh, border which is, you know, state capital. And, uh, you know, one of the, what I was really excited about on this project was to be able to work with and interact with, um, you know, artistic and creative people on, on both sides of the border. We have an artistic um, community that is uh, interested in filmmaking as such. California has a long history of this. Mexico also has a great history of, uh, of cinema. and. Uh, I think it would just be wonderful for Calexico to be supporting this, and then if this would bring uh, these two, you know, uh, titans of cinema together, you know, Mexican cinema as well as California. All right, thank you. Gracias, gracias. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Our next speaker is Anush Shukla. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Robert Garcia. Antonio García. Y lo aprecio. 
She's talking about, about the parks. Um, ¿Cómo se dice? Si hay una queja, uh, mencionaste empleados. Si hay una queja, si hay, sí, pero sí. Me, me gustaría que se fueran esas quejas. Si hay específicamente alguien dentro de ese departamento o personas que de plano uh, llevar esas quejas para formalizarlas y que queden en los expedientes de esos uh, empleados. Ok, gracias Carmen. La siguiente persona, Gilberto Manzanares. Buenas tardes. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Gilberto Manzanares. No vengo a regañarlos tanto. Este. Just a few things that I want to mention. Este, we're working on the, the art project for the Calexico aquí por todo el proyecto aquí. Um, we've already received a lot of art from talented individuals. Este, 
ocupamos funding para este proyecto. No sé si de ARPA, Downtown Rehabilitation, se podría sacar o algo así. Eh, also, también, if the city could follow up, ya pasó una semana de que pedimos los, la información from the city, and that every time we need something from the city, el proyecto para. So, just make sure that the problem gets rolling. Este, the Rockwood Local Demo, eh, la presentación que dieron, se vino muy bien y todo, la verdad, ahí en la calle Rockwood, eh, nomás una concern ahí con eso, eh, we don't have public restrooms todavía, y, y pues está el asunto también de los homeless, like, yo miro planes para rejuvenecer el downtown, but la gente no va a ir, y es like, hay, hay olor de orina y, y esos desperdicios humanos, Just one street over, está la Pauline, este, which last year, eh, se murieron dos personas in the span of hours. Se murieron uno en julio 9 de 2021. Hours later, they found another one. Both of them died by heat exhaustion. So, ocupamos los cooling centers, porque las, las temperaturas ya, ya están aquí. We, this is a community that's been uh, largely overlooked. We just can't wait for the heat to take them all. So, we need action on that. Este... También una cosa que I just want to bring to the council's attention and, and the public. Eh, había un grant de affordable housing, something that's badly, badly needed aquí en Calexico, porque yo vivía en San Diego, and that's just kind of funny that now the prices are just like over there. So, you know, mm -hmm. ya no es tanto de que, ah, ya, te vas a ir a San Diego porque está caro, no, like aquí también. Este, al Central Apply, 32 million, gratis, gratis, todo, 32 million for affordable housing. Imperial Applied, 35 million for affordable housing. Probably applied 13 million. Calexico, no people. So we need the staff. We need to get Calexico rolling. We need we need to not rolling it. Que se levanten porque look at every every other city in the Pier Valley is moving. Affordable housing, tackling something that's huge. Nosotros estamos hablando de the painting projects de la casa, sí, you know, the little projects for la comunidad y todo facilito. Something that should be easy, right? But right now, está difícil. But también están los biggest problems with just affordable housing. Para low, low income, low income, medium income, todos. Um, hay como young professionals como yo también, que nomás no, no pueden la oportunidad de comprar casa todavía debido a los precios. Y pues every other city is applying, every other city is getting millions and millions, y nosotros sentados, not applying. Así que por favor, eso pues que tengan en, en mente eh, para que puedan hacer staff la ciudad properly so that we can get qualified individuals who know how to write grants. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Alex Perron. Honorable Mayor, Honorable City Council, Gloria, Gloria, Javier, Camilo, Rosie, Phil Campos, and Chief. Uh, I just want to respond to uh, Benjamin Gordon's concern. Uh, he is right, there's a big discrepancy and we are uh, uh, trying to coordinate an emergency meeting. Gabby is working on it. And the, once we have that, uh, we're gonna clarify because it's about $30,000 or more that we don't know what was done with the funding, but soon we'll know. And I just wanna clarify that city council. And uh, I know a lot of times people come here and complain. And uh, you guys are doing a good job. And you know, we can't do a lot of things or please all people, but uh, I want to tell you, you're doing a good job, all of you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, interesting night. <laughs> the city manager report, next. Uh, good evening, uh, the public that's here present, Honorable City Council. Um, I just want to make sure that I, that I let our employees know that every day we receive complaints throughout the day. We try to service a city of 40,000 plus people. We have hundreds of complaints every single day, and you guys are doing an amazing job at meeting most of those needs. I appreciate what you guys are doing. Low, very low staff. We have four people trying to operate more than nine parks. The same individuals are the ones that have to take care of downtown. And they also got to take care of public service buildings. There is an issue there. Uh, and Lily, you're doing an amazing job with what you have. 
we're, we're being asked to go 100 miles an hour and your car only goes 25. And somehow you're still making it and I appreciate you for that. That goes as well to every other department, all my employees with the city. I have uh, had the opportunity to, to be your leader for a couple of months. And I, I mentioned this to my department heads earlier. I say, how do we survive, right? How do we survive? That was always my question. How does the city maintain? Well, I'm, I'm starting to find out the reason we're maintaining is because the employees that you have are pulling miracles. You guys come to the meetings, you see that we're short staffed and yet we're still able to accomplish most of our goals. We hear a couple of complaints here at, at the uh, city hall meetings, but we got to remember that there's 40,000 other people living in the city. And for the most part, we're doing a very good job at meeting the complaints. Yes, there is issues. We're, we're aware of that. And believe me, um, your employees are the ones who want to make sure we fix these, right? So I just want to make sure I take the opportunity that every, every employee that I have in the city of, city of Colexco is appreciated by me. I, I appreciate everything you're doing. Please continue to do the same thing. Uh, this is a job and you guys love your job. Please continue that love. And uh, whether we get complaints or no complaints, I appreciate you. Thank you. I'm sorry, I got one more comment, and this is probably the biggest one. Uh, we have a special meeting for the department hearing workshop scheduled for tomorrow on the budget, right? Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, we're going to have to cancel that one. We're going to move that one to... Let me, get, let me get the time so that way we can let the uh, public know. So the June 16th meeting, we're moving that to the 21st at 2 o'clock. This is the opportunity for the department heads to come to uh, in front of the city and present their ask and their needs. So we're moving that one to the 21st. Uh, it was suggested that we move our the special meeting of the 28th uh, to the 27th. We're also doing that. So the budget and, and the reason this is happening is our budget is fluid at the moment, right? We're working on it for the most part. We're trying to get to a balanced budget here. By moving it these days, it gives us the, it gains, or I'm say it, we, we gain a couple of days to make the changes that you guys will suggest at the upcoming meetings. So this is a move again for our employees who are scrambling to make the budget and this gives them a, a little bit more time. So just to reiterate here, the 16th, June 16th meeting, which is for tomorrow, is moved to the 21st and that is starting at two o'clock. The meeting for the 28th has now been moved to the 27th at 6.30 and we'll make sure that this is publicized on our website, uh, that all of our, um, our email partners are noticed and all that the rules are followed here. Thank you. So the AOA is going to be June 21st and 27th at two o'clock, is that what you're saying? The one for, I just had it here. The department briefings, we had originally scheduled it for two days, right? Um, the department heads that are coming to do these meetings also have other tasks. And these are the other stuff that I'm talking about that for the, and that we're, we're servicing the whole city, right? So we, we spoke with them, we met, this allows them more time to actually get a good presentation scheduled for you guys. So yes, we are moving that one, and that's going to be at two o'clock during the day because they're here working. We can actually, you know, get that one. And then on the one for the special meeting on the 28th, we move that to the 27th, and that's going to stay the same time, 6:30. Yes, and this hopefully give 6:30. Yes, and this just gives our employees uh, the opportunity to to fix the changes that are going to be coming up after we hear from the community, and uh, that way we can present a nice budget. On the 27th. <clears throat> That's it, Mr. Wheeler. Yes, sir. Wheeler, thank you. Um, our next item is uh, City Council comments and reports of meetings attended.
Uh, we'll start here on my right. Mr. Fernandez. I don't have anything. Thank you. No. Thank you. In, in the interest of time, uh, I'm just going to uh, congratulate all the uh, IBC graduates that uh, you know graduated this uh, weekend, Saturday. So uh, a very, very pleasant time. Uh, then also, of course, you know, CUSD, um, high school, uh, Aurora. Um, then uh, all the promotions, you know, all the little ones, you know, it was really happy to see them, uh, you know, finally, uh, you know, start their summer. But um, again, this is a very... Uh, you know, festive time, you know, because people get to finish their, their, their education, move on to higher education. But thank you. That's, that's my report. Thank you, Mr. Garcia. So there any? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, I, I do have some comments, and I'm very happy that uh, Supervisor, uh, President of the Board, Escobar, is here. Uh, it saves me a trip and probably a WhatsApp phone message uh, to you and Miguel and, and Rebecca. Um, this ha pertains to the city, uh, but definitely I do want you to hear uh, from a city perspective uh, the things that I'm seeing because quite frankly there was something that I was made aware of today which was what Ben Horton referenced with the Caltrans not being able to economically reimburse the businesses affected by the 98 corridor. Quite frankly it pissed me off. It, it pissed me off to incredible levels because it brought me to a bigger realization about the way the state is treating us and the conversations that together uh, we, we should elevate uh, to expedite how we get rid of uh, or how we get out of the high-risk status uh, that we currently face ourselves classified in. But before that, starting with the city clerk's department, I'm really very, very concerned about Gabby's workload. Incredibly concerned. I have been concerned since the day I came here. Whether it's budget movements or administrative movements, we need to give our fabulous city clerk a break. Whether it's rotating the tasks that she does here at city council meetings or in the commission meetings, uh, splitting them between council members, the city manager, or clerical staff across various departments, that would be a big help. Because look at this, it's, uh, she works until 5 p.m. on paper. She's here right now, it's almost 9 p.m. And we approved action minutes. Her task was lightened to the point that just about any other clerical staff could be sitting here right now and she could be either in her office doing the piles and piles of work that you know are never ending for her because she's the only person in that department which is a nexus to public information for her city to her citizens or just quite frankly resting. So whether it's a budget movement that we're gonna get her some supplemental support or administratively rotate, especially the stuff that she does in city council right here, right now, uh, I would like to see that done as, as fast as possible because it's just an injustice that I feel bad sitting here and witnessing it right in front of me, uh, knowing the importance of that particular department um, and, and, and her workload, it, it just has to happen as, as soon as possible. Second thing is I'm looking forward to the Citizens Grant Writing Committee. Uh, as was signaled by some of our community members, we have a lot of grants that are waiting for our applications. I'm waiting anxiously for June 29th, which is when we will know whether or not the joint application between the County of Imperial, the State of Calexico, and a bunch of other uh, stakeholders will receive state funding to help our homeless family population, not just in the city of Calexico, but in the county. It's a multi-million dollar grant. Uh, we're still in the running, it's June 15th, so that means we have some good probabilities, but let's hold our breath and pray for June 29th. I would like this council to please consider changing the grant ordinance. There's an ordinance out there that says all grant application must get city council support. I disagree with that. I, we're too slow as a council. The grant process moves very, very quick. It's in the job descriptions of our directors to go after these grants. So the barrier should not be waiting for a city council meeting to say, okay, go ahead, go ahead, Lili, or go ahead, Lisa. They should just be allowed to get grants and through administrative direction and through the direction of this council, uh, we can keep an eye on that if there's any abnormalities and grant applications that need to be stopped. June 22nd uh, will be my first uh, 
commission meeting as the newly appointed Imperial County Transportation Commissioner for the city of Calexico. It is at 6 p.m. I invite the public uh, to attend that. I'm very excited for that. I've uh, always thought about transportation, but I already have some updates uh, to share with you. Very excited uh, to jump in in the point in time where we're having our talks about the long-term transportation plans. I'm already proposing uh, some quite revolutionary things that will have a big impact on the timetables uh, countywide, uh, having to do with the microtransit services that are going to be grant funded and operational by the end of this year. I had two very important meetings with stakeholders uh, from the county, from ICTC administration, the Office of Assemblymember Garcia and representatives from the California Department of Transportation or, or Caltrans. There was one yesterday and one uh, today. I'm not gonna go into too much detail since the proposals themselves need to be detailed and written and of course submitted to the community for robust outreach and input be before we take action. But just to give you a taste of what we're going after. The first meeting was a brainstorm of potential Highway 111 long-term solutions as the corridor faces more projected traffic density, whether it's population growth or the doubling at lanes at Calexico West Port of Entry. The goal was to begin exploring potential funding sources and the feasibility of bridge overpasses over the most transited east-west county corridors, which would be Heber, Evan Hughes, Eaton Road, uh, to alleviate uh, traffic and to clear right-of-ways for potential uh, public transportation projects. Both meetings were absolutely fantastic. I appreciate the participation of all the stakeholders, including the Assemblyman's Office, as uh, many of these projects will, have, uh, will need uh, extensive dialogue permissions at a legislative level. Uh, it was so incredibly productive in terms of the realization that our state and uh, especially our state counterparts had uh, about the dynamic transportation needs of our specific border community. The second meeting was about the potential relinquishment and visions for Highway 111 and Highway 98 in city limits to ensure that their designs and all projects that are being constructed right now are in alignment with the city of Calexico's new economic development patterns as well as the state's adopted environmental and equity goals for the 21st century. Whether those highways are ultimately within city limits, uh, whether they ultimately remain under Caltrans jurisdiction or if they're relinquished, we're working, we working quickly to respond to community concerns around those corridors that have always uh, been present for, for decades, including but not limited to equity, safety and pollution along those highways that traverse seven school zones and one of which is a very popular commercial trucking route. I was um, very pleased uh, to see the willingness and the speed at which everybody at that table was, was willing to work on those projects. So I will, I will be keeping everybody updated. However, in those conversations, especially today, I was very agitated and quite frankly angered um, by what I perceive to be an injustice to this particular city that I want this whole community to know. So if you guys remember correctly, for this fiscal year or for the, the, the quarters that were affected, financial quarters that were affected by the border closure, the sales taxes for the city of Calexico went negative about $800,000. As a border city, not a border community, but a border city, we were the most acutely affected in terms of economic revenue by the closure of the border ports to visa holders. And then on top of that, the closure of the specific Calexico East port, $800,000. On top of that, because of the closure of the East port of entry, we faced an increase in the need for traffic control, which totaled $350,000 for that fiscal year. Businesses affected by the State Route uh, 98 widening phase right now hasn't been measured. I'm just gonna take a wild guess that uh, over eight months easily, I think we're looking at overall economic impacts negative of 100 to $300,000. So if we're keeping track after everyone, and I mean every government agency, all levels, has taken their term harming our city in the most stressful point of the 
pandemic in one of the most disadvantaged communities health-wide in the nation that was most affected nationally. The feds, the state, ICT, C, all of which harmed our city and we can see it in the numbers, we're counting at at least $1.5 million in losses. And after all of that, the rebound, this resilient city in this quarter reports a $500,000, a half a million dollar surplus after the border is open in this particular quarter. You add all of that up and it's anywhere between $1.6 million to $2 million that alone would have met our reserve requirement conditioned by the state to get out of our high risk status. So I just want everybody to know, and I, I'm glad Miguel is here to commend him, because a lot of this work is his work. Um, the unfortunate austerity measures that, that had to, to come, the cuts, he put us on the right track. And it, had, and it wasn't so much that COVID took us off the path, but it was the harm by each of these levels of government at our weakest points that are the reason we are not where we want to be. And one of which, the state specifically, that right now is impacting at least five of our most, uh, of our largest businesses on that corridor, doesn't even blink to harm us and not consider changing the expectations based on the harm that they have done to the city throughout the pandemic and with their current project. So they put us through that. It's an injustice and it's a conversation that the city needs to bring up to the higher level, specifically to the state ASAP, because I don't think any of those things have happened to any other city. And lastly, so it doesn't come to surprise to the council, as Mr. Uh, Horton uh, mentioned, and this will be my last point, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I was told directly by ICTC Director Aguirre today that we, were, would, we would be hearing from Caltrans soon uh, for them to tell us that by statute they were not able to help with the economic losses of the businesses along the corridor uh, that they've been facing for almost a year, a year now. It's about five amazing businesses. We need to expedite, apologize, and get them their sidewalk permits ASAP. One of those businesses, which is uh, the Tropicana hot dog stand, came to the planning department, to the front window, and was told, despite council direction, was told that they could not get a sidewalk permit to mitigate the losses on their businesses. And that's, that's us dropping the ball. So we, we need- Which one was that one? Tropicana. So and, we need to- where's their business at? It's off of the 98 corridor that's affected, next to the donut shop, next to El Sol. So we need to actively reach out to them and just give them that permit uh, as soon as possible. Okay, uh, and direct, direction was given to? At last city council meeting. No, no, I know, I'm saying direction was given. I just wanna make sure that we're, we're clear the direction was given to the staff mm -hmm. in regards to the sidewalk permits. I just wanna make sure that there was uh, maybe a miscommunication or something, but I'll look into this yeah, for sure. It, it must have been internal within do, And do we have a, a name for this individual that you're talking about? I don't remember her name. I was told her name, but it's a Tropicana business. Okay. Sebastian Franco, there you go. Well, I'm sorry? Sebastian Franco. Okay, that's it, okay. So it's, it's a tragedy uh, and it's something that we need to bring to the state's attention as, as soon as possible because the city has been resilient despite all the odds. We've been doing things right and it's just not fair that uh, people get to put obstacles and you know, they don't even take that into consideration and they really spoil the very good work that the city has been doing and they ultimately starve the community of services uh, playing these kinds of games. So uh, that's, that's what I've seen today. I'm very angered by it, but I'm also very hopeful that this council is gonna take it by the horns and we're gonna go get justice for the city. Thank you. Do you have anything on the ad hoc committee? Oh, I, I just said I'm, I'm, I'm ready for it. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you, Mayor. Welcome, Miguel Figueroa and Cachu. Nuestro supervisor, Estrella. Congratulations. And, <laughs> <laughs> and of course, everyone for being here and Calexi Connect Chase. Thank you for your comments. And we need uh, your support 
supervisor as soon as possible for traffic control. I want to congratulate all the students who, uh, who graduated in this year 2022. Congratulations also the parents. And we need to have better parks in Calexico, Mr. Favila. Please pay more attention in this area. And we need to translate to this meeting into Spanish, please. Thank you, Mayor. That's it. Thank you, Ms. Rowell. Um, you know, it, it's interesting that we do have some challenges here in Calexico and uh, mainly because of the pandemic, obviously we're exiting that, but I really appreciate everybody's efforts. Uh, we have a resilient community that really cares about Colexico. We care about Colexico. And I just want to point out, I know Mr. Mr. Ureña was uh, one of the stars that had a uh, committee for grant writing. Hopefully, we'll bring some relief there for your office. They can get some extra funds there for you. Uh, I'd like to commend him for that, for spearheading that. Um, also, um, we did this, so far this year, I believe, over 200 either permits for businesses or new businesses or contracts. Uh, condition your permits at the tune of three hundred thousand dollars. We talked about this, so people are invested in Calexico. That's that's the hope we have. So moving forward, uh, there's a lot more to be done, obviously. Um, and I can go on and on, but for the sake of the argument here, it's nine thirty almost. Um, I did get a call today by the mayor's office, uh, Mexicali Mayor Norma Bustamante, uh, her official invite for us to go over. Uh, for the binational uh, health com uh, commission we're, we're uh, um, trying to form and I am, I am, we did take the offer, we received that, the, the call today, so Ms. Romo and I are going to be part of that to let you know we're going to be uh, having those conversations uh, in the near future. There's a lot of moving parts to that because we're dealing with two uh, countries, um, so as, as we move, move along we'll We'll keep you posted on that. But I'm really looking forward to working with Mrs. Romo. She brings a lot of experience uh, by working with the government in Mexico. So I'm looking forward to that. That's all I have. The next item is the consent agenda. All matters listed under the consent calendar are to be considered routine by the city of Calexico. Calexico Community Redevelopment Agency, the successor agency or Calexico Financing Authority, and will be enacted by one motion in the form listed. Any item may be removed from the consent calendar and considered separately by the city council. That's okay. I need a motion for consent agenda. Motion to approve. Motion. Second. Second by Mrs. Mr. Garcia. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carried. If I will, thank you. Okay, no items pulled for consent calendar for discussion. Our next item, discussion and potential action items. Number 15, presentation by Rebecca Terrazas and approval of letter of support for Imperial County Lithium Valley Economic Opportunity Investment Plan. to share with you this group, um, the community and the community, the Imperial County Lithium Valley Economic Opportunity <coughs> Investment Plan, which from now moving forward, I'm gonna refer to as ALVIP just because it's a little long and I get a little tongue tied at times. So, uh, This plan was unanimously passed by the Imperial County Board of Supervisors in February of this year. Um, and it's a formal plan of action, more considered as a roadmap or a framework um, that is intended to help bring new economic investment uh, to the county while at the same time protecting the county's residents. So this plan is a result of many discussions with community leaders, community organizations, educational institutions, and also industry professionals in order to make sure that we found that balance between economic development, uh, public health, environment, and, and at the end of the day, community benefit. So prior to going into some of the specifics of what's included in the plan, I would like to give you a brief overview of what lithium is. 
in, that way you can have a better understanding and, and also understand why our communities are really aiming to benefit from this incredible opportunity to recover lithium in Imperial County while helping the state at the end of the day reach its uh, climate and energy goals and our nation also help them become energy independent. So lithium is a soft silvery metal. Um, it is a rare mineral. It's used in many products from computers, cell phones, household appliances, even medication. And it's a critical element of advanced batteries for electrical vehicles. So with California's ambitious um, energy and climate goals of reaching one and a half million zero emission vehicles on California roads by 2025, and also the president's goals of decreasing our energy dependence on foreign sources, the demand for lithium ion batteries is really skyrocketed and it's created a gap in lithium supply globally. So locally, this mineral is, is, can be found in geothermal brine. brine. Um, for more than 20 years, we have been aware of these minerals that are available in that brine. Uh, but due to recent technologies and the high demand of lithium, lithium extraction is becoming more and more possible in Imperial County. So the brine is currently pumped from the uh, ground during the production of baseload geothermal energy, along with other rare minerals such as manganese, zinc, and silica. Um, and the geothermal brine is currently, what it does is goes through a closed loop process where after it is uh, pumped from the ground and the steam is used to generate uh, power uh, for turbines and electrical generators, it is re-injected into the earth. So the lithium developers right now are currently refining the technology that they will utilize to extract lithium from this rich brine during this process. So basically, at the end of the day, adding another step to the process that's already happening in the, geo in the geothermal energy development. Um, so, but keeping it in this closed loop process so that it's still environmentally responsible at the end of the day. Unlike the open pit mining that is taking place in other countries like Chile and Argentina, I'm sorry, in Chile, Argentina, and Australia, um, open pit mining has a large footprint and that nearly eliminates any biologic life at the surface. But um, with geothermal uh, energy, the footprint is a lot smaller. And as we mentioned, it's something that's already kind of happening. It's just adding another step to it. So that's why um, everyone here is talking about Lithium Valley. So where is Lithium Valley? What is Lithium Valley? Lithium Valley is in a portion um, of the Salton Sea known geothermal resource area and the southern uh, eastern portion of it, where there are currently 11 geothermal power plants in operation there. Um, and so this is near the communities, as you can see, uh, nearest to the communities of Nyland and Calipatria in the map above. So as many of you know, um, over the years, Imperial County has faced many struggles, including chronic double-digit unemployment rates, high poverty rates, and lower median household incomes when comparing them to the state and even the nation. So the Imperial County Board of Supervisors really sees this as, um, sees the increased interest in lithium as an opportunity to improve the lives of those in our community who are looking for a chance to really earn an honest living and provide for their families. So the future is really bright for the county and uh, we want to share that also it's believed that the largest concentration of lithium in the United States is right here in Lithium Valley which is the area that I showed you earlier. It's estimated to contain about 15 million metric tons of lithium. So with that being said, currently the 30-day average price of lithium is around $70,000 a metric ton, which means that the potential for what we have is really, truly a game changer. So as the technology to extract the lithium is refined and the process really becomes more efficient, we anticipate that thousands of jobs at the end of the day will be created. The benefits from extraction and ancillary businesses created from it will fundamentally change our entire region. And what I talk about as far as the ancillary businesses and others, we're really looking at vertical alignment. We're not just considering the extraction of this mineral. We're looking at what else can be produced or developed as it's being extracted. You know, is it gonna be those um, manufacturing companies uh, for the battery? Is it gonna be auto manufacturers at the end of the day for those batteries to go into those zero emission vehicles? Um, so these are all things that we're keeping in mind. So um, as you know, we are a unique bi-national region and it is important to be really on the forefront of any decision or action that will impact the lives of those in this region, that live in this region. 
So the Board of Supervisors adopted this plan so that we can control our own economic future that's related to uh, lithium rare mineral extraction and all related development that you know, eventually we hope to establish our, our communities come out better off. So um, in addition to the plan adoption, the Board of Supervisors have also done several actions. One of them is that they created the Lithium Valley Economic Opportunity Investment Plan Outlet Subcommittee. It's composed of two board members. Um, it's one of them is Supervisor Ryan Kelly, who represents that northern Imperial County area where Lithium Valley is located. The other one is our chairman, Jesus Eduardo Escobar, who also represents here in Calexico. Uh, we also created an internal working group to that subcommittee. Members of that internal working group are, in addition to those subcommittee members of the board, we have um, key staff in there, uh, executive level staff and, and other staff as well that play a key role in really helping to develop the plan but implement the plan as well. Um, we are currently exploring the economic viability of an enhanced infrastructure financing district, so really looking at other tools that we can utilize in order to incentivize its development um, and also to benefit from this development. Um, we're working on that with SCAG at the moment. So SCAG has kind of offered mm -hmm. to assist us with conducting uh, feasibility study and so forth. We are um, developing a salt and sea renewable resource uh, specific plan and programmatic environmental impact report to provide industry with some certainty. And uh, we do plan also to conduct a Lithium Valley infrastructure assessment. Uh, we understand that an assessment needs to be made in order to make sure that we are properly prepared for uh, the various uh, traffic and movement that will happen in the corridors that are in that area. So for the past year and in the coming months, the board will also work to provide leadership to those in uh, the private and public sector to make sure the county and our communities are uh, benefit from any action or decision regarding this vital resource. And that's an action that they have been doing over the past several weeks as well, especially when it comes to the discussions with the state legislature and our administration uh, as far as the budget discussions that have been taking place. So um, now I'd like to outline the various requests that are stated in the plan that's in front of you that we have of the state and federal governments. Um, one of them is that Imperial County is requesting that the uh, California Energy Commission, the CEC, increase the county's delegated authority to permit geothermal power plants from 49.9 to 99.9 megawatts. So I'm gonna quickly go over these bullet points and then I'm gonna give you some updates after this as to our various requests. Um, we're requesting $5 million for the uh, specific plan and programmatic EIR that I mentioned earlier. We are uh, requesting funding for a Lithium Valley Development Office that will provide direct feedback to the development um, on project status and shepherding projects through the permitting and planning process. Uh, we are requesting support and assistance in the crea creation of an um, Bureau County severance tax or resource levy. Uh, for critical minerals where the fees would be directed to infrastructure, environmental mitigation, community enhancements, community benefits, and so forth. Uh, funding, we have requested also funding for a higher education campus or, or, or to expand uh, current higher education efforts, uh, basically so that way we can make sure that we have the workforce here available and to provide the proper training needed uh, for the workforce that will be needed as well. We have requested also some seed funding for a reference lab for lithium purity testing that we would like near the area where the lithium is being extracted. Uh, we have also requested annual funding for the period of five years for a new GoBiz tax credit or other credits and incentives uh, for lithium rare mineral extraction at Lithium Valley. And then also uh, we requested an executive or legislative action that results in the exclusion for current and future projects that are within the county specific plan and programmatic EIR. Um, so those are the requests that were outlined in the plan that the board adopted in February. Um, though, however, there are current actions that were related to these specific efforts that I'd like to share with this council. So on May 11th, the CEC did approve to simplify the process um, so that that, that way they can delegate full authority for the certification of geothermal power plants to a county uh, that has adopted a geothermal element for its general plan. Basically, at the end of the day, what the CEC has done is they have provided authority to counties that can show that they have a, a similar certification uh, program that the CEC has um, to approve geothermal power plant projects in, in those counties, jurisdictions, with no limit. 
as to what that wattage is. So previously, the county had the authority to approve them at 49, up to 49.9 megawatts. Um, as I mentioned, we requested if we could increase that amount to 99.9 megawatts, um, but they've now increased that to pretty much any size, as long as we are able to meet and show that we have a similar program to the state. Um, uh, so on May 13th, the governor released his budget May revise. Um, and the updated spending plan puts a large focus on lithium development as the state and the world move toward a clean energy future. So therefore, the governor included in his May revise several investments that are intended to support the development of geothermal and lithium extraction uh, facilities in Lithium Valley. So shortly following that, about two weeks ago, uh, the California Senate and Assembly released a joint budget agreement uh, for fiscal year 2022-2023, and that did include some of those investments that the governor had included in as far as his proposal in, in the May revise. So we're happy to see that it included the $5 million that we had requested for the uh, specific plan and the programmatic EIR. It did add some elements to it that they would like for us to include um, for community planning and engagement, which we're happy to oblige to. So. Um, and it also includes some funding in there for CBOs to assist in those efforts as well. So uh, we're happy about that. The $80 million, uh, it also included $80 million to expand the campus infrastructure at the San Diego State University Brawley Center. Uh, San Diego State University does plan to create um, pathways for local residents uh, to benefit from those jobs that are created by the anticipated growth. And so they're looking at uh, putting together a STEM facility and expanding that Brawley Center campus. So uh, that was included in both the governor's proposals and in the joint budget agreement. Um, some of the other things that were included that they're still under discussion about is the uh, funding for incentives for those um, lithium developers and for those projects. Uh, they're also looking at uh, additional incentives and assistance when it comes to equipment purchases related to the extraction, processing, or manufacturing of lithium. And then they're also looking at additional investments for transmission, because um, aside from lithium, we're talking about additional geothermal development as well. Um, we have additional capacity there at the Salt and Sea Known Geothermal Resource, set, um, resource Area, about, I want to say, 1,500 megawatts more that they can still tap into. And so we're looking at that increasing as well in addition to the lithium development. And so we're going to need transmission lines in order to get that power out of here and sell it. And so that's what they're looking at investing in as well. Um, the governor also proposed, which it appears that the legislature did support as well as part of uh, both proposals and agreements, is that um, all these developments will also include strong environmental protections and be in close coordination with local entities, community-based organizations, um, environmental and social justice groups, non-governmental organizations, and uh, native tribes as well. So um, we just want to share that good news with you. We feel that we've made some real traction and progress with the work that we've done so far. We had to do it very quickly. Uh, we understand that um, it's, you know some people, some concern was like you know we, we kind of had to jump and. and show a plan right away, but we had to. We had to take that step. We had to be forward thinking um, in order for the state to really know that we were here, for the state to listen and to know what, that we need to benefit from the, the development. We cannot be forgotten throughout this process, and we needed to make sure that we advocated for our residents and make sure that aside from the jobs that may be coming from the development, there's other benefits that come with it. So um, nothing is assured, though. We still need to work hard. Um, especially for the governor's budget trailer bill language that proposes establishing a tax uh, per ton of lithium extraction to provide funds for restoration and mitigation efforts at the Salt and Sea um, local governments and also includes some grants to support disadvantaged communities in the region. So because certain issues are still pending and the framework of a budget was passed on Monday, um, but as I mentioned, it's really skeleton right now as far as the budget that the legislature actually passed on Monday. Um, the details are still being worked out, so the legislature will be tasked with adopting an amended version of the budget at a later date once they come to a final agreement with the governor. So they have the joint budget agreement that they're working at, the governor's budget, and right now they're trying to find a happy medium of where they can agree on all the different details, not just lithium, everything else that's included in the budget as well. So we're, we're still working closely with the administration 
and with the legislature to ensure that our um, asks are being heard and that hopefully they get included as well at the end of the day in the budget. So at the, in the plan in front of you, there are also some requests that we had of the federal government. At the federal level, uh, we were requesting funding for railway upgrades. We we're requesting funding for uh, offsets for electrical grid upgrades and funding or loan guarantees for companies that desire to build and operate end of life recycling and reuse facilities. So as I mentioned, we're looking at vertical alignment. Uh, we have to keep in mind not just the manufacturing, but batteries have an end of life. They don't last forever. And what are those methods that are gonna be utilized in order to recycle them later on? And how can we be a part of that as well? So we were, I want, uh, what I wanna share with you at the federal side is that we were recently informed that each member of our congressional delegation selected at least one of the seven community project funding requests that the county had submitted for consideration to be included in the uh, fiscal year 2022-2023 federal appropriations budget. So for those of you who may not know what a community project funding request is, is um, it's the new term for earmarks, because earmarks were gone for several years. They brought them back last year, last, the last budget cycle, and that's a new term that they utilize for earmarks. And so those are intended to support district-specific projects for congressional members, uh, both at the, in the House and in the Senate. And so we submitted seven projects, as I mentioned, all of the congressional delegation that we have representing us, so that includes Congressman Vargas, Senator Feinstein, and Senator Padilla, um, all put in requesting, uh, requesting funding for some of those county projects. So um, two of them, I wanna say, they're, they're both bridge projects, uh, they're both to replace uh, 75, one's 75 years old, another one's 82 years old timber bridges that we need replaced in order to make sure that we have the proper infrastructure in place there in that traffic corridor, in that corridor that's gonna be uh, in that near vicinity of the Lithium Valley to make sure that we encourage that development. So um, also the Biden administration did make an announcement Last month that the Department of Energy will make available $3.1 billion in grants to fund new retrofitted or expanded processing facilities. So you're seeing the commitment, not just from the state side, but also from the federal side, as to really wanting to make this effort uh, beneficial and also a success. So we're hopeful that these grants could help bring vital investments to the area and, and really helps to encourage the industry folks to, to come to the area. At this point, I have reviewed with you the requests that were outlined in the county's uh, outbip that is in front of you and progress that we've achieved thus far. Um, but the success of this plan really relies on the support and the collaboration of all, of all of us. So the county's next step is to really work closely. And what we have been doing is working closely with our legislative delegation and the appropriators at both the state and federal levels to really ensure that the funding is included in the final appropriations packages for fiscal year 2022 and 2023. So the County of Imperial is hoping to receive support from our local and our surrounding municip municipalities of the county's efforts so that we can achieve success for the betterment of our community and the residents at the end of the day. So therefore, that's we have we ask of this council for a letter of support of the county's LVIP and related efforts towards the development of Lithium Valley and the forthcoming jobs, infrastructure, improvements, environmental mitigation, and community benefits that we hope and are planning for. So thank you all for your time and I'm here for any questions you may have. I also have with me here today our chairman, Jesus Escobar, and our CEO, Miguel Figueroa, who can also add to it if they'd like or can help with those I questions. I have a motion to approve extending the 40 minutes more for the meeting. Yeah, we're, we're getting at that 9.30 mark, so motion by Mr. Romo to go past 9.30. Anybody second? Second. That? Second by Mr. Garcia, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, motion carried. Continue, yes. Okay. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Does anybody have anything to say? No, I don't have any questions. You do? Okay. Do, hello? Is this mic work? Hello? Have to get really close. Okay. That was a very, very painful presentation to watch incredibly painful to see slide by slide the details all these details 
that we have not been informed about as a city council formally, that we have not been included in the conversations as to which bridges. The plan itself is underwhelming. It lacks analytical depth from that economic consultant. We, there was no input in what kind of economic consultant was approved, their credentials, their background. I bet you this community doesn't know his name, and they should, because a project of this magnitude is a public economics affair. So the analytical depth of that plan, I don't know if there's more pages to the plan. There obviously are because behind that eight page plan there's all this information. And I'm sure behind that information, I mean, I'm just, I, I just have to ask the question directly. Why do you, what, what is the deadline for this? What is the deadline for? For this, for us endorsing your plan. There's no specific deadline for our plan. What we're working with right now is focusing on the budget process. The budget process takes time. There is a constitutional deadline, as I mentioned, of June 15th. However, um, as I mentioned, they've kind of already adopted a framework. And as they're working out details as to what the actual text is of the language, then we'll know more. But there's no specific deadline, I guess I can say, uh, for our plans specifically. Beautiful, because there, there's no way I can blindly approve this. I mean, there's so many questions. This is the first time this is brought to us as a city council, and there has already been so many decisions made. If no, uh, I, I, I can't vote yes on this. There's so much more information behind this that doesn't fit in a PowerPoint pl presentation and the whole community outreach piece. I mean, if I feel disincluded as a city council person, how does it, my community feel? Community All cities. Board. And so my question to Supervisor Escobar is, um, I know this plan already went past the Calipatria uh, City Council. Was it approved by them? Have they okayed yes. this new plan? Yes. Okay. The Calipatria City Council did approve it. Huh? They did. They approved okay. a letter of support, and they sent one as well to the government. I, I would also like uh, to hear either the written or the recorded opinions of all the tribal councils that are affected by this plan, because I don't see, um, I, I, I see that they're mentioned here, but I don't see their opinions. I would like to see the opinions of the tribal councils, because at the end of the day, we're, we're talking about an ancient lake, lake bed that has a lot of their history, and so I would like to see their specifically what, what they said about it, not just that they were included, because oftentimes their voices are talked over, and we tokenize them, and we say, oh, well, they were at the table. Well, I would like to know what they said at the table. What did they propose? What did they agree with? And what did they disagree with? And I definitely just right off the bat want this county to divorce, completely divorce any conversations on lithium with any conversations on the proposed uh, gold mine on Indian Pass. Because if that gold mine is a part of the lithium plan, it can, it can as Blancarte and uh, other, other members have wanted it to be. Um, if there's ever any association between those two plans, it will have my immediate opposition. No, no gold in this. The, the gold thing is such a travesty, a violation of human and indigenous rights that if it comes close to this plan, it will have my immediate opposition. So I think for right now, it definitely should get tabled. Uh, we have a lot of discussions to come back to with the county. Um, and I'm still waiting to, to see the decision-making process and the substance and analytical depth and I just want to talk about the investments. From the state, you know, we're very happy that we're getting $80 million for SDSU for, for a STEM, um, for a, a STEM building, a STEM extension in Brawley, and that's great. That's really, really good. But that's something that the state owes this community because whether or not there is gold in the ground, whether or not there's lithium in the ground, 
Our students in this community deserve an equitable education to the rest of the state. So it's not, they're not doing us a favor. They're barely repairing the neglect that they have had to this community for so long. So in, in, in the lack of depth, I just, I just see everything geared towards the actual manufacturing and nothing in there about social equity, uh, discussions about uh, potential gentrification, housing prices. Um, it just looks like, it just looks like it's someone with a corporate development background as opposed to someone who is a little bit more geared towards public economics and public policy with more social issues as opposed to just strictly business. And so for at least right now, um, definitely just on the time, the depth, uh, we, we have a lot of conversations to, to have on this plan, please. Thank you. That's your opinion, Mr. Ureña. Mayor? Yeah. Comment? Um, yes, go ahead. Good afternoon, Jesus Escobar. Um, I think we're missing the big picture on specifically lithium and what yeah. lithium will bring to Imperial County. I think we're looking at specifics that you may not either know, understand, or need more information on, which I fully agree. But again, we're taking baby steps on something that's going to be transformational for Imperial County. That's true. We're taking, I just said baby steps and I take it back, we're taking a huge leap on what is going to be transformational for Imperial County. Why do I say this? Because there has been nothing, I'm 49 years old, almost 50, there has been nothing in my lifetime that would change the economic landscape of Imperial County, not Calipat, not Lyland, not Westmoreland, the entire Imperial County than this. It will bring economic opportunity that we currently do not have. I believe you had uh, unemployment rates of 18 to 25 percent. Self-explanatory. Low to moderate income across the board. You want to talk about the rich city, which is not rich, which is imperial, or the poor cities, which are basically where this is at, Calipat, Nyland, which is a township, and Westmoreland. This is going to transform the entire community. This is going to be able to bring about environmental change. And you know I'm a very, very staunch proponent of it because of my family history. So when we talk about social justice, environmental justice is join at the hip, están casados. So when we talk about financial funding, you're right. California wasn't there for COVID. We busted our ass, and sorry for the word, to get the vaccine here, to get support here, to get funding here. Look at Caltrans, 98, perfect example. I mean, it's one after the other. This will transform Imperial County and make Imperial County independent of how we currently live our daily lives. What do we live on on a daily basis, most of us? Look at where we're at. Government, city jobs, school jobs, county jobs, the IED, which is not government, but it's a co-op, and agriculture. We want to talk about agriculture, we've got 70 to 100 millionaires. ¿Y qué más tenemos? Gente que cruza todos los días porque no puede vivir en Caléxico, porque le pagan el mínimo, sí les va bien. Entonces, esto va a cambiar, transformar la economía de nuestro valle. Por eso es importante de apoyarlo desde ahorita. ¿Que está perfecto? Claro que no. It's not perfect. It's been something that's been worked on for the past, what, two years or plus or minus? And it exploded. Why did it explode? I think it's two pages before that. Where are lithium prices now? $70,000. Where were they a few years ago? A couple thousand dollars. That's why it's a market. That's why there's everybody and their mom is interested. And we should be fighting together because we all should be fully aware that there are two out of the three companies that currently have geothermal, quasi uh, lithium uh, potential in Imperial County are fighting this tax. They're fighting this tax. They don't want to give us a red cent. And they're doing the rounds, sending emails, sending publications to basically short 
the entire Imperial County and specifically those areas that we talked about where you and I both know a significant amount of the taxes will be invested in. So again, we should be banding together on this infrastructure and we should be able to work together on finding the nuances so we can add those nuances to make sure that it's fair and equitable for everybody. But I'm willing to guarantee that this opportunity is an opportunity of a lifetime that are gonna give a plethora of opportunity to all of our children and all of our grandchildren. So then let me propose this resolution because I, like you say, this is a fluid plan. This is a plan that has been in the works for about two years. Um, no, lithium, lithium as a whole in mm -hmm. Imperial County has started taking baby steps. This yes. really has evolved in the past six months to be, to be brutally honest with you. Right, and, and, and in, all, in all that time that we've had, that we've been thinking and working, this is still the first time as a city council that we are engaged, and that is very unfortunate. So I'm not against lithium, but what I'm saying is, first of all, we don't need to approve this tonight, and secondly, what I'm proposing to, for, for the sake of, of, of unity, but also finding uh, an, an avenue to correct what a lot of people might see as, as deficiencies in the plan and getting more information on that plan, uh, definitely on the scope and, and the depth of the economic analysis, I would just make a very simple proposal. I would be happy to adopt this plan with, with an attachment uh, that I promised I would help the county write, which is a, a substantive, a robust community engagement plan that, that binds this county to certain standards of community and government uh, outreach and engagement uh, so that this is a fluid process. I don't want to put a stamp to say, no, this is what the city of Calexico wants because, no, this is what the city of Calexico is barely hearing for the first time. So I don't as, disagree as, with as, you, uh, Council Member Ureña. I think what we need to understand, though, is there is no community engagement. There is no plan. There is nothing there. Yes. But we don't succeed from a tax perspective. Because everything will be driven by the tax that we as an Imperial County will receive. And that tax will then be, obviously, I, I, I understand. divided between I, the seven cities and specifically the northwest end that obviously needs it the most, and it's gonna be most impacted in all regards. So, so again, before I think we're putting the carriage before the horse, of course. because without that funding, there is no plan. So in, in the creation or in the design or in the proposal of the tax to the state, do you think that the county should do that on its own or that we should all have a piece in that conversation? Because I have not been approached on the design or the modeling of the taxes. Councilman Ureña, um, uh, nice to see everybody, mayor, members of the council. I so, think you remember him. So, so, so there's one, one thing here, and, and um, as I hear your comments, um, th that is why I wanted to approach the dais mm -hmm. and, and just share that there is one component that I think Ms. Terrazas Baxter touched on, and I'll elaborate a little more. Mm -hmm. There's a component of a programmatic environmental impact report that's needed. Um, that is going to come it's included in the trailer bill language. Mm -hmm. um, that will basically uh, set the foundation uh, to have a holistic approach where we have one large environmental study mm -hmm. that can undertake all of the development that's gonna go in there. One of the important pieces of that uh, function is to have a community outreach engagement. Mm -hmm. I'm very happy to say also that we have local CBOs, community-based organizations, from the north end uh, there will be playing a pivotal role in this uh, that will particularly align with a lot of the items that you're raising mm -hmm. that will create the awareness with all the cities. And Ms. Terrazas Baxter, can you please correct me, but out of uh, the seven cities in Imperial County that you've gone and provided uh, presentations to, how many have adopted a letter of support? Five cities that I presented to have adopted a letter of support. I, I just had this one uh, scheduled still on the books and I'm still awaiting to present to the city of Imperial. Part of the difficulty and the time, the, the delay has just been that uh, I'm the one presenting and I'm one person and so there are meetings that are at the same day, on the same days and sometimes yeah. at the same time and so I've had to spread it out 
um, to make sure I go to all of those meetings. So. There, there is also something, um, aside from what I'm sharing with you, that I hope uh, provides uh, some clarity mm -hmm. as to how we, we will address some of the items that you're raising, uh, that this county, uh, through its representatives, has gone up and done its due diligence uh, to make sure that a voice is heard on behalf of all the cities, the unincorporated areas, mm -hmm. especially those communities and townships in the North End, to make sure that there's a clear understanding that the investment will be for the people uh, and the infrastructure that's needed uh, so we can all prosper, as you've heard from uh, Chairman Escobar and Mr. Razas Baxter. So um, I just humbly wanted to intervene to rest assured that some of the items you raise are not only being looked at, but being worked on. Thank you, and, and, and that does, uh, may I? No, no, hold on, just speaking of citizens, because it's very important you raise the so question. I'm all, yes, I'm with Mr. Horton, who's a citizen of this community. What do you got to say, Mr. Horton? I just want to say I concur with uh, Ms. Tarazas and, and Mr. Escobel and Mr. Figueroa. If you look at the history, and you want to put all the wolves for Calexico on the state, that's wrong. We have sent money back to the state for grants that we received because we didn't act on it. We had a $9 million grant to revamp the airport, we sent it back. I just want to say one thing. I'm not an island. I do listen to the news, I read reports, and if you want to look at this Lithuanian deal, what do we get our lift from right now? Where? Uh, Mr. Uh, Urena, what do we get our lift for the, to do our cars and everything? What well, do we get it from? A couple of, like out of the world, not in this one. I mean, no. Where do we get it rare. from, mostly? The lithium right now? Yes. Bolivia? China, I would say. China. Hmm. Okay. Now, do we want to be dependent on a country that's going to make us whatever we are? Okay? Mm -hmm. I want to say, and I say with the most strongest of voice, that this city council supports yes. the county and their, and their, uh, what they want to do for the betterment of this valley. We always stand by and say, we didn't get that, we didn't get that. You know why we don't get nothing? Because we don't get up and work for it. We don't understand and we don't do our research. I sit back and my boss requires me to do my research. When I get ready to move, we make a suggestion to him, and I talk to him every morning at five in the morning. We just don't sit back on our laurels and do nothing. And he even talked to me about this Lithuanian deal. I said, this is a great opportunity for the Valley as a whole. If we miss the opportunity, like Mr. Escobar has talked about, somebody's gonna pick up the gauntlet and run with it. And then you'll be sitting there, we had our chance, but we lost it, as always. Ladies and gentlemen, please, I implore of you as a citizen, approve this. Now, we can always adjust, we can do amendments, we can work with things, but first we gotta act on it. If we don't act on it, we're like everything else. And I'm gonna say a comment that I was gonna say earlier. The Constitution gives us many things, many things, but it also gives us the ability to be stupid too. Let's don't be stupid, thank you. I was going to respond to uh, Mr. Figueroa. That, that does uh, reassure me on, on, on many levels, absolutely. I just want something explicit. I want this to come back. Um, I definitely need at least one more meeting to run this by social justice organizations, environmental justice organizations. Um, it's a lot of money we're, this is, a, this is a lot of information we're voting on to endorse. And I think I, at least, I, I need at least a meeting to definitely talk to you guys, definitely to analyze, definitely to check in with the social justice groups. Uh, but I'm not opposed to it. I mean, definitely if it's, there's an explicit commitment for it being fluid, if there are tools and mechanisms built into it uh, to make the community engagement rich and vivid and robust. That's fine. Uh, so that's that's my opinion. I, I definitely can't pass it right now. I need more information, more engagement. Uh, but if it could come back for for the next meeting, that would that would be good. Thankfully, there's no rush to to this particularly. Did they say action? Potential action. Yeah. Discussion and potential action. So all it needs is a. Uh, uh, 
A motion, motion. second. If, if, mm? yeah. if, if I may? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So here we are again. You know, I can't believe that we are on our own worst enemies. I mean, let, me, let me start by that. You know, for the last 21 years, I have seen a lot of the same. You know, unemployment numbers is sky high. You know, in fact, you know, the numbers that you're citing, they're, they're quite, uh, you know, they have improved a great deal. Yeah. You know, you go back 15, 20 years ago, those were worse. You know, my, my work in this community has centered around that, around, um, you know, helping people better themselves through uh, training programs, vocational training programs, assistance with employment. And we have had a lot of uh, opportunities that have come and gone and, um, you know, uh, we were putting our hopes in, 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 in a lot of those, uh, you know, opportunities. But, uh, but I see that this is different. This is different. Um, in, in, I know we're, the, we're in the infancy stages, and, and I think, you know, going back to my, my first remark, instead of getting together, I mean, we are, I mean, kind of like going against each other, and that's the wrong approach in my book. Um, information has been there. Um, the Lithium Valley Commission meets every, every month. Everyone is represented there, including, uh, you know, the Comité Civico del Valle, which, you know, happens to be part of what you uh, alluded to, Mr. Ureña. Uh, so you have everyone there, right? And the Lithium Valley Commission also adopted a letter of support. As Correct. Well. I was going to get to that because I was, I was part of that. I mean, I was listening to that um, meeting. So if you have these individuals talking about um, supporting because this is the time where we have to be together. Uh, and, and this will pave or, or, or help us with a lot of the things that we're talking about. We're talking about affordable housing. We're talking about employment opportunities. We talk about upward mobility. But without providing the support to this type of initiatives, you know, we're sending the wrong message. And guess what? I, I, I know Supervisor Escobar has, very, has been very strong in his message that this is a Imperial County resource. And he has been very strong to be vocal about that. But we know that you know, there are outside forces that are just looking at us also. And at the first opportunity or at the first you know, misstep that we take, they, they, will, they, will, they will go and seize that opportunity themselves. So I don't want to see more of that, yeah. you know, 25% unemployment, 28% uh, unemployment. What I, I do want to suggest, maybe, that I didn't see, and, and, and this probably is going to come in, in, in um, later stages, but I don't see an approach to including early uh, education you know, engagement, interest, you know, at the, at the you know, um, K through 12. I, I know we're talking about SDSU, we're talking about Cal Poly, but I think also in creating a sustainable workforce, a pipeline to these jobs, we need to start early. And I think it needs to be in this plan. That's what I will add also. That's the component that I'm not seeing um, because you know, kids are talking at the, at the high school level. I just participated in a CTE uh, meeting uh, a week ago, and they were asking me, how is lithium, gonna, uh, lithium industry going to uh, affect, you know, us as, 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 as K through 12, uh, you know, institution? I know we have to prepare, you know, STEM courses and all of that. So again, I think I'm getting ahead of myself, but I think that's the component that has to be here. So we can make sure that we have the, also the pipeline for SDSU or Cal Poly. Because one thing that I don't want to see also is that we're going to keep on bringing people from the outside to meet those workforce needs. I think that's one issue that we had with, uh, with uh, solar panels, with, with the, you know, um, uh, all the, the renewable energy uh, industry. 
He would say, you know, we're bringing people from the outside, even though that wasn't the case, but the optics were there. So I want to make sure that this is, stays in Imperial County, that the approach is Imperial County, and that the benefit is Imperial County. I want to hear also more about what's the engagement with IID, right? Because we're going to be generating, and I love the fact that we're going to be generating more uh, power or the possibility. I want to make sure that, you know, some of that power stays here. That help us lower our, our utility costs. That could be a part of the part of the public benefit to the community. I mean, there are so many things, but I, I understand where again in the infancy stages we are working on this. This is exciting. I love the discussion. I love the ideas that have come up with uh, you know from this project. I love the fact that you know other people are talking about this also. How can we, you know, get together, produce studies that will benefit this industry because we don't have none of that in place right now. So if we delay more, uh, I mean, the, the, this approval of this project or this support, I think this, this is going to set us back more in the timeline. And again, people keep on looking at Imperial County and they're saying, you know what, we can even get an act together. So with that, I just, I just wanted to make those comments. I completely, um, I'm in support of this uh, proposal, this letter. Yes, you know, we would like, and I would love to be included in future conversations, maybe it, as part of this group, because, it's, because it is important that, that you know, city, um, well, the cities have representation at yeah. some, some, some sort of group. So that's my ask. Um, and, and again, I, I moved for approval. Um, or this letter. I second it. I do have, some, I do, I do have two clarifications uh, to make if I may have some discussion yeah. on the item. Um, the first one was this portrayal that I'm against this plan. Absolutely not. Or I, against lithium. I'm definitely not there. You're throwing statistics about unemployment at me as if I don't want this. I just want it to be done right with the community's input. You referenced Comité Civico uh, and the Lithium Valley Commission. The last time uh, that came out on the newspaper was May 13th, 2022. That was when the commission approved and lent their support to that plan. Since, correct me if I'm wrong, the plan hasn't changed since May, correct? Since the, since the Lithium uh, Commission approved this or sent their letter of support, it, it's not different from what we're seeing right now. No, the plan has not changed since the, February. The plan has not changed. The plan changed. was intended as more of a roadmap of a framework uh, to provide us really with direction on how we're going to proceed and making sure that our community benefits from this development. So, no, there hasn't been any additional adoptions of changes mm -hmm. to the plan, but what we've been doing is making those changes in those various advocacy trips that we've been doing to with Sacramento and the legislature as we're advocating for this specific um, incentives and the tax in the budget. So that, that being said, this plan went to the Lithium Valley Commission on May, mid-May, and I just wanted to read uh, to, to my colleague the comments of Daniela Flores, which is a part of the Comité Civico group part of Imperial Valley Equity and Justice, a big voice in Calexico, uh, just to highlight the fact that there's problems with this. She said, I think it's premature to lend support for this plan, said Daniela Flores, a lead community organizer, advocate, and co-founder of Imperial Valley Equity and Justice Coalition. I don't think our frontline communities have had an opportunity to see their feedback reflected in this plan. I supported the direction, um, that's, that's on mail, hold up, hold up, hold up. One second. Which one is it? Who? The mail, the mail, the Yeah, you know, so. I, I, I supported the direction the county was headed with more conversations of commitments uh, to uh, environmental justice and equity. While I agree with some of the points in this letter, it's too early for me to provide support as is, given that some concerns were raised. I must stay true to my role as disadvantaged community representation. So Olmedo also does not support at that particular plan 
for the same concerns as in the first, or, is, or has that changed? No. Um, no? Actually, uh, Luis, um, the, the vote was taken on the commission level at IBC. Two. And um, uh, I may be wrong. I, all I know is that Mr. Olmedo was there in attendance along with the other members and, and the letter passed. Did, and, he, did, he, did he vote yes or did he vote no? My, my understanding is that there was some discussion that was had given that at a previous meeting, and I know uh, Councilman uh, Garcia follows the meetings, that there, there had been discussion of some items that had to be polished and that came back. Mm -hmm. um, and as a result of it coming back, that's why it got approved. Um, so, and, and I also recall Ms. Flores m m making those comments, but I think at the end of the day, that, that there was consensus that the right thing to do was stand in solidarity at the local level to make sure that we can proceed and as a domino effect, have this trailer bill in Sacramento be backed up by the whole valley as it moves forward. Of course, of course. But I mean, at, at the same time, I just wanted to make clear that I, I talk to Daniela every day, and Daniela talks to Luis every day. And what I keep hearing is, Raul, there's problems with the community engagement in the lithium plant, and I... I, I possibly need to ask for permission, but I just have yeah. some messages uh, within the past five minutes from, from Mr. Luis? Romero yeah. okay. acknowledging support. Okay, good. That, that's, that, that's important. And, and, and if I can just, uh, you know what, I, I wasn't really bringing this up, Mr. Romero, you know, without his permission or his agency, but um, I just wanted to bring up the fact that, you know, all this uh, discussion of commission has been made up of, of community stakeholders, including, you know, individuals that, you know, advocate for different uh, parts in the community or interests and, and, and concerns. So, again, the discussion has been very robust. Um, I do agree, you know, Ms. Flores has been also uh, uh, present um, in those discussions or at least participated and um, they have not been ignored. They have not been forgotten. No one is being pushed to the side. I think this is something that, uh, you know, I, I will move to support. You know, there's always ways that we can continue to be engaged. I think by them reaching out and even staying at 10 o'clock at night. I mean, that shows also the level of interest. I, and at least that they're reaching out, that they're making their best effort to be a good partner. And we need to welcome that also. And we just need to make sure that we continue to be partners and uh, we get an invitation to sit at the table one of these days. Thank you. And I believe as uh, Mr. Figueroa mentioned earlier, um, what he referenced was additional community engagement um, happening later on in the process as well. Uh, when it comes to the development of the programmatic environmental impact report, but also when it comes to the funding that we are advocating for to, with that tax, um, and also um, the funding for the programmatic environmental impact report includes, I want to say, about $800,000 for community-based organizations to conduct that community engagement so in I'm coordination with the local stakeholders. So I'm, I'm, I'm 80 to 90 percent like they're ready to to vote yes on this. Okay. Definitely just not today. Uh, it's still rushed. Give me at least a meeting to check in with all of these people and get some more information. And you could, I mean, at least on my end, you can see my support by by early July. But definitely not right now. But we're 80, 90 percent of the way there with all the information coming in from Figueroa. So, um, with that, uh, there's a motion on the floor. I think we're ready to vote. I think Mr. Orlando wanted to talk to you. He's having some problems with uh, oh, beautiful. Zoom. Yeah. Por favor. Yeah. Está comunicándose conmigo. Está. Dice que. I can help clarify. Él quiere. Clarificar. There's a link on the, on the, on the city. Uh, Mayor, could we move on? It's already 10, 10. Yeah, um, no, I, I think this discussion warrants a little bit more than that chime. It's so important. It's trillions of dollars. We can have a conversation about this. It would be a disservice to just rush something.
Yeah. 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 But but if if this letter of support was not important to you, you would not be here, disinvested in. Okay, ya está aquí el señor Olmedo. Adelante, puedes hablar. Eh, sí, creo que está la, el tema de, de los impuestos. Sí. Yes. De, de lo que se está pidiendo al, al Estado. Es una carta. Señor Olmedo. Bueno. Just, just for the public record, I do have you next to the microphone at a public meeting. Um, right, right now we're having a conversation uh, with the city council about the letter of support for the lithium uh, plan, the same one that was uh, support for the commission. Um, my question to you is, how do you feel about this? Um, have you lent your support to it? How does Daniela feel about it? Are there still concerns about community outreach? Or are we ready to proceed with this? Uh, what, what is your take on this particular plan right, right here and right now? Uh, yeah, so um, I, what, what's happening right now is that the state is, uh, you know, given there is a surplus budget, there's uh, an opportunity right now to move um, you know, policy through the, you know, through the budget process. And uh, what's, I think what the confusion may be um, to some advocates is that these projects are still need to be permitted. Right. There's a whole process of programmatic EIR that will occur. What's being asked right now uh, by the county is that there be a $5 million investment to assure that the county has the resources to do a programmatic EIR. That's where we as a community and the county identifies all possible environmental impacts, uh, all possible risks, and we participate in that. So a couple of things that the, that the governor's office has uh, Assembly member uh, Eduardo Garcia have put on the table, which I feel is, is hasn't happened before, is that they're actually putting money. There's eight hundred thousand dollars that are going towards the community's perspective, the community engagement and participation in that programmatic EIR. I have never seen where we have had that kind of a resource in the budget. The other part of it is that they've also put uh, resources for an environmental impact report. Again, never before seen. I really believe that uh, Governor Newsom, and of course we know that Assemblymember Garcia and Senator Van West have always been champions of social justice. Uh, but you know that's what's on the table right now is this tax. Uh, this tax is going to go to beneficial projects throughout the Imperial County. Eighty percent of the money is intended to go to the county. Twenty percent to Salt and Sea projects. We know that we are in a crisis, and that Salt and Sea needs these dollars to be able to accelerate projects and, and get them, uh, again, to provide us that health protection. The 80% right now is still being discussed as to how that distribution, right? There, there is some expectation that Assemblymember Garcia will put forth uh, a equitable distribution uh, of those dollars, not to the level of detail, because this is the county. Once the county gets these dollars, we locally here need to be at that table and participate. Right, it is expected that the cities will get an equitable portion of that, uh, and is expected that the, what the, we call the fence line, right, the, the very closest communities, which would be like uh, Calipatria, Nyland, and so on, that they also get an equitable distribution of these dollars. This is tax dollars. This is taxing the um, extraction of the mineral per ton. So this is this is not. We're not even at that point where we're talking about. What are those community benefits that can come off these projects, right? This is not, that has nothing to do with the environmental um, review and the mitigation and the potential community benefits agreements that could come from that, right? So, uh, uh, so to your question, I apologize if I'm yeah, getting that, too much that, detail. No, that, 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 it is that, good. We're, we're about to submit <coughs> it tomorrow. Good. Uh, very much in support, and it's signed by um, you know, pretty much all local advocates. Uh, here in Imperial, uh, those that you um, trust. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're good to go. You know, I apologize again if there's too much detail, but I want to make sure that, that I clarified that. Comité Civico is not in any way an enforcement of the industry without us seeing the detail of what that uh, industry and, 
and it's it's um, the methods, how they're going to manage the waste streams, how they're going to assure that the communities are protected, and how they make sure that there's still a lot of work to be done. This is this is kind of laying out the table so that there is an equitable and fair engagement and participation and distribution of resources. That, again, I think that sometimes there's a little bit of confusion so as to where, where the process is at. Luis, last last question. Um, are you are you satisfied with the the tools for community engagement in the plan? Like, do, do you have the faith that we're going to move uh, in, in the way? I have I have a lot of faith, uh, a lot of confidence, and I'm actually pretty amazed the fact that that the governor, in, with support of the county are setting aside the resources to create those engagement tools and those engagement opportunities. So so yes, I've never seen that in you know my twenty years doing environmental justice work. Uh, mm -hmm. usually I, 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 not known to file litigation you yeah. know on, on bad sequel processes, bad environmental processes. Mm -hmm. We're ahead of that. This is saying here's some resources so the community can have a meaningful engagement. This so good. Uh, this, this is good. Yeah, it is good. It, this is not saying. You, you, you know. You know what, Mr. Olmedo, you should have given this presentation. Thank you. It, it, it can have my support now. I, I, I think that gave me the level of detail I was looking for. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, of course. Mayor. Uh, Mayor. Can I just um, maybe if you can give direction to Gabby to accept that phone call as a public comment. Make sure that we to document it because I don't I don't think this is a, a normal procedure. But as long as we uh, document it as a public comment by Mr. Old Meadow, sure. that way we just have it for record. So if you can just so make sure you give that uh, the direction. Thank to you. I, I, yes. I, I'm ready to vote now. Okay. And and so, there is a motion on the floor yeah. and it's been seconded. So we can call for a vote, please. <coughs> So we'll start here. Aye. Huh? Yes. Aye. Okay, see, see, I love you. No. I, I'll change my vote to no. Okay, hold on. <laughs> Which is hey, in, in, in the municipal the, code. If, is, if is she's doing no, vote you still got to vote. Okay, so you're. I, I'm allowed to change my vote. It says yeah, I know you are. I know you are. But so what's your vote? No. No? Yes. 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 So no. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Muchas gracias, Rebecca. Hola, hola. Thank you. Thank you. We'll see the discussion. Okay. So that vote was done with? You didn't just give a letter of support for that No, 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 no. Hold on. It, it can come back. So is there another motion? It can come back or we can write our own letter. No. Mr. Reina, is there another motion? Is there another motion? Oh, the, yeah. This, this motion dies, so we right, entertain right, another right. motion. I'll, I'll motion to table this item to the next meeting, pending a conversation with the county, uh, and probably internally write our own letter as, as well. OK. So when you say pending conversation? So ju just, just table, yeah. OK. So table, do you want to table it? Mm -hmm. Pending, OK. Take then you want to second, Ms. Moromo? All in favor, I say aye. Aye. No. No. OK. The word. Table it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so, uh, excuse me. Uh, item number 16, uh, adopt a resolution of City Council of the City of Calexico approving the employment agreement with Esperanza Colio, Warren appointing her as City Manager of City of Calexico. Yes, uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, before you is an employment agreement with Esperancia Colio Warren uh, to be the city manager of the city of Calexico. Um, the city went through an extensive process, hired an outside consultant to interview candidates, and at the end, the uh, city attorney's office was directed to negotiate a contract pursuant to the direction of the city council. And so before you now, we do have that employment agreement. And I'm going to go through a couple of the, the major terms of the agreement. It provides for an annual salary of $181,000 per year provides for a five-year term commencing on July 6th uh, of this year, continuing through July 6th of 2027. Uh, also provides for a monthly vehicle allowance in the amount of $400 per month, 
Um, all the benefits are tied uh, to the um, Calexico executive management, except for minor ones that are detailed in the agreement, provides for an annual performance evaluations, um, provides termination with and without cause, uh -huh. um, and provides membership in the ICMA and uh, related organizations. Um, at this point in time, uh, bringing the agreement uh, by the city council, we would need at least three votes to, to uh, approve the agreement. If you have any questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer them for you. Okay, anybody have questions? No? Questions? Over here? No? no? Okay. Okay, motion to approve. To approve by Ms. Romo. Second. Second, Mr. Uh, Urania. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, motion carried 5 0. 5 0, okay. M Mr. Mayor? <clears throat> uh, item 17, authorized. Uh, yes, okay. uh, can, can we entertain a motion to approve the rest of the items? Unless um, there's discussion? You know what? Yes, but there was a there was an item. Uh, oh, there's a discussion. A item? public comment, but Belinda, but I don't think she's here, so on 17. Okay. So nice we'll, nice okay. That'll make sense now. Okay. okay so, so you want to so make a motion? Mo motion to approve the rest of the agenda. The rest of from uh, 17, uh, 17 to 20. Hmm? Okay. Motion by Mr. Rodenia. Let's just check. Do we have any public public comments on those items, either online or written? Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we've done that. Okay. So motion by you. Mm -hmm. Second was uh, Romo. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Motion carried. Five well. Thank you. Uh, the last one is official item, agenda item. Anybody? I don't, I don't have anything. Okay. No? You do? Yeah, I see Mr. Favila and Mayor. I would like to propose uh, a space in the two regular meetings uh, or agendas so that the presidents of the commissions give some report of, the, of uh, their meetings. I think this matter uh, has to do with uh, Mr. Campos because it's necessary to change the municipal code, no? Uh, if it's the order of the agenda, that's very right. it's codified in the code and we would need to revise that. Okay, that's it. Okay, thank you. You have anything? No? Anybody over here? No? I don't have anything. I moved, uh, well, any motion to adjourn the meeting? Motion to Motion by Mr. Garcia. Second. Second by Ms. Romo. All in favor, aye. 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 Motion carried.